Hey, what's up, Scott Ball? Come here with Imagination Creation Films, and today it's Friday. It's yet another time for another live stream. Why? Because that's what Fridays are for. Also, Thursdays, Wednesdays, Tuesdays, Mondays, and then pretty much any time we get somebody on. And uh, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not anything special. It's the guests that that bring everything to this little community. But we have a special guest today. A special guest that, well, I mean, he'll tell you we've been trying to figure out and get these synergies going. Um, for weeks now trying to get him on, but we got him. We got him. The, the Ryan Connolly, the man, the myth, the legend, the, ah, screw it. Here, hey, Ryan, <laughs> hey, what's going on, buddy? <laughs> the a-hole. <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> so tell us about yourself. Well, um, I was born in Florida to uh, Judith and Tim Connolly uh, on a rainy summer's eve. Uh, I don't know when I was conceived. Actually, you ever think about that? Like, what month were you conceived in? I mean, I know what month I, I, I was born. Yeah, I, I try not to think about it because then it starts going in a dark place. <laughs> <laughs> what were they doing at that time? It was a Neil Diamond concert. <laughs> That's <got> right. wild. <laughs> Why was it the B side? Couldn't they just try the? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> My inspiration was a really bad choice. It was. <laughs> I'm glad we finally got to do this. It's been a long time coming. For sure, man. And I greatly appreciate it. And we have got, well, well they're flooding in now. Um, so, okay. Let's dive right on in. Let's I've got several in. guests lined What's up over here who got to come word? in. What's that? What's your favorite curse word? Which we can't say. Right. No, word. no, you have two minutes. <laughs> I will not demonetize you. I promise. <laughs> we got there's your Ali. Uh, Ali is the official timekeeper of uh, my channel. Uh, he he likes to keep time. Ali, I, I just got to let you know, buddy. Ryan has a hard out in two hours, so he's not All going right. to break any records except maybe the attendance record. Uh, we, we might get that one. We might get I'm, that one. I'm getting a little crap from the Diamond Boys about not breaking any records. <laughs> <laughs> They, they, all they were doing was breaking my bladder. I, I can go four hours max, and then I'm like, don't take one. bathroom breaks. They said it was ten like one five plus. Hours. It was like over five hours, right? Uh, Josh did not take a bathroom break, but he was dying. No I, way. I swear I'd he's be broken. like, hold on a second, play music. I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, or just swap to your phone. Just go to you know whatever. It's, it's a family. Why not? <laughs> right. So everybody out there, if you got questions for Ryan, put them down there below. We'll try to get to them when they make sense when we can, but try to get to them early because um, it's two hours, you know. So, so Ryan. Yes. Go on. It started sometime for you when you were young. Yeah. What was that first, not filmmaking, that first inspiration of creativity for you? What what happened there? Where When was that? What? That's that's actually something I've, I've been thinking about more lately because I've been asked that question uh, a couple times in the past like six months, which really hasn't been something I thought a ton about. But the more and more I think about it, it's very interesting, especially because, you know, I have my own podcast and um, that's something that's become oh, really- you do? Like, where is that? Where can we see that? I, well, it's it's Ryan Talks, the podcast. I just get real close to the mic and I get my <laughs> sexy it's like uh what do they call it asmr or something like that right you have to no whisper, podcast. Whisper. i just do all it's just mouth sounds for an hour straight <laughs> <laughs> but i i do think it's interesting like what um because people in this sort of field i think music as well any sort of intense creative field it's, it's just a very specific different sort of thing i've had many jobs including construction work which was very, really hard but um you know there's nothing quite like it the you know it's kind of like the the self pain brought onto yourself willingly it's um i always think about you know like uh watching my my wife you know with child labor and everything she she goes through this you know horrible labor it's so painful most painful thing she's ever been through i'm like my mind's blown at the superhero she is that she's doing this thing and it ends and i'm like i never want to experience that again and like two days later she's like i could have another kid <laughs> like, what's wrong with you <laughs> like i didn't have to do it and i'm like i don't want to go through that again you know and and uh filmmaking kind of it kind of makes me think about that a little bit because i mean obviously not comparing the two things very different but no, it's the, uh, the the roller coaster of emotion that is insightful I yeah like and 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 the the pain that 
comes from the deep desire to create and express and to give an audience something. I always say it's like saying I love you to someone and waiting to see what they say back. But even that's when you put it out, even before you put it out, the intense desire for this to be something that's not okay, not good, but great, the best thing you could possibly do right now. Uh, so you put you just put so much stress on yourself to where you dry heave on the way to set and things like that. So it's it's always interesting to me to find out what those kernels were that planted the seed that grew the tree of this thing because we all you know you it's a disease we can't not pursue this thing it's not an option there's no other option um <clears throat> so for for me i think it probably has to do with like you know i was an adhd kid and um you know because of that it wasn't a ton of friends and i don't think i was really fully you know understood you know your friends would come over the house that were my age and I'd knock on the door and i'd be like what up guys and they're like hey what's up is your brother home and i'm like oh <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> and i think it was those things where i I mean, that sounds much worse than that. I had a good childhood and all that stuff. My parents were incredible. Um, I'm, I'm very, very blessed and lucky with an amazing family, amazing brothers and sisters. They're, I mean, my family is the reason I'm, Wait, I'm at right You now. said brother and sisters. I thought but you had two brothers. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, wow, what happened God. recently? Yeah, I got a massive family and they've just like, Man, they're, I, I can't speak highly enough of my family. They've The second I ever have needed anything for the dumbest flight of fancy, hey, I want to do this. This would be cool. They're like, sure. It's like the town. You know the scene in the town? Uh, I need your help. Uh, we, you know, we're going to hurt some people. You can't ask me why, whatever. And Jay Renner just says, yeah, whose car are we taking? That's how I feel <laughs> like my family is. I just show up like, all right, I need your help. <laughs> we're going to skin a chicken. We're gonna, there's going to be sh shaving cream involved, and I'm going to film it. <laughs> It's like whose car are we taking? Um, anyway, I don't know what I'm talking. I'm rambling. Now. So what I mean, as a young child, what what made you be creative? What what that's what did you see? Yeah, right. Well, it was a long time ago. <laughs> I think it I think it was, you know, um, I, I do remember, and I'm much calmer now, like it's calmed down over time, especially once I realized like I do have a little bit of that hyperactivity. So I found ways to sort of focus it and deal with it better. And, and just getting older has like alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. But and getting older has calmed it down. But I think back then it's like, I didn't know how to express myself. Like there was a thousand things going on and I could only say like 10 of them, you know? Um, so it became like, I, I think that's why it became like this desire to, you know, convey a story and uh initially it was just like putting on plays for my family which all my brothers and sisters we all did it i wasn't the only one who did that but it always frustrated me that they weren't quite getting what i was what i was seeing what i was trying to show them they just weren't seeing it the way i wanted them to see it so i remember my dad brought home a vhs camera and i don't i don't know if it was our first one or what i don't even know how old i was my mom says i was six like I always say, I that sounds a little young to me. I have a four-year-old and I don't <laughs> but once she said <laughs> but hey, she said it. I always say eight because that seems more like that's probably true. Uh, but who knows? Anyway, um <clears throat> I was just looking through that viewfinder, uh, you know, getting people to see the world how I see it was the major click of like, oh, I can get them to see the thing I'm I'm trying to get them to see. And I think that I think it was really just a way like that I discovered that I could focus this madness up here into something, you know, I could funnel it into something and I think that became a gift to me you know, that I didn't realize I, I I don't think I realized that it was this gift that it was giving me something to take all this energy I didn't know what to do with and put it somewhere. And that's probably why it became such an obsession. And then, like I've said a million times, then it was Jurassic Park, 11 years old, an experience like I had never had that really made me realize like, oh, this is specifically it. Like, you know, a movie for an audience as a director giving them this thing. And, you know, it's pretty much, the, I think those two things is what really did it. What point happened where it went from this is all I like, this is all I love to do to, oh my God, I can actually make money doing this. When, when did that click for you? Uh, I'll let you know when it does. <laughs> <laughs> Not fair. Uh, uh, I, it never did. It was never, um, 
I mean, I hope this doesn't come off as like it's not about the money. Because it'd be great to make money. Dude, if I make movies and I make a ton of money, that'll be dope. (laughs) I am into that. But it's never been a thought. It's still not a thought. Um, You know, Film Right has sustained us, but it certainly hasn't made me rich. You know, even the gear we have is not because of all the money we have lying around. It's because of the companies that were willing to partner with us. Every film I've ever made, I've lost a lot of money. (laughs) I have never made money on one of my films. Never. And even, you know, I've been uh, ballistic open doors and I've been pitching to major doing stuff with more major players now. And I have not made a dime. I have only lost money. Um, so it's never been about that. And I, that's never been a thought process. Um, but I mean, it would be great. It does sustain like film rights. Yeah. Sustain. It sustains you. And that's, it, and that's more, it is more of a disconnect though. Cause it's like my storytelling doesn't, but this company that at least revolves around, you know, filmmaking does. So it's this weird, like it's kind of compartmentalized in my head a little bit. So I guess that's why it's like, a little difficult to fully answer, but uh, you know, I mean, I'm lucky and, and thrilled that I get to do film right, and that actually, you know, sustains. I mean, it's a, it's a it's a reasonable statement. I mean, do do we we don't make money going to a job? We make money because we are at the job making them money. Yeah. So it's it's same, your passion. I mean, if you're a computer guy by day, your passion might be doing computers. You're doing your passion. You're getting paid from it. So it's the same with you. Your passion is film. You're doing your job. You're getting paid from your job, but your passion yeah. is film. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, Hollywood hasn't made money on their films either. <laughs> <laughs> I think they might beg to differ on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on where you are in the yeah the. the the Hollywood model is is a mess. I, I I'm not gonna let you comment in case you're still trying to get jobs up there. <laughs> yeah, not comment. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like also as I dip more toes into it, it's like you know there there's a lot of outside looking into that stuff, which is you know easy to make judgment calls on, um, but it is it, you know it's a tricky business. Uh, and I think it's a lot of people trying to do the best they can. And I, you know, the the further I get into it, the more the nobody knows what they're doing is so true (laughs) it's so true everybody's just trying to figure it out especially now in the landscapes we're currently in and what's the future going to look like where those things going Uh, right it's interesting i hear a lot of i don't knows it for sure there are plenty of those but there's also a i mean a metric buttload right now of people who are saying (laughs) i want to work love it yeah well i I just tried to be My mom's probably watching. I got to keep it clean. So metric, um, buttload, <laughs> metric buttload is probably okay. She's probably <laughs> texting me right now. It's going to be bad. Um, buttload. <laughs> there, there are. There's a ton of people out there who are figuring it out how to get work, and there are people working right now. Yeah. I mean, I've got I've got a shoot in Atlanta, hopefully here uh, in like two three weeks, and I mean it's a big oh, wow. shoot. Great. I'm excited. Uh, I mean, there's going to be all kinds of. We don't know how to do this yet, but. Yeah. I mean, I think the industry is begging right now to get back to work. Have you seen yeah. any of that? <clears throat> I mean, for sure. I, I mean, I've heard a lot of it. Um, I, you know, there's, like I said, there's a lot of outside looking in with a lot of things uh, for me. I mean, I'm in Texas, I'm in my house, <laughs> I'm in my, my office, uh, home office right now. Uh, but yeah, there, you know, I've heard a lot of talk about, you know, what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, or at least how they're trying to figure out how to do it. They're going to get back. Ah, Kessie, baby, what up? <laughs> I was waiting for it. How you doing, baby? <laughs> <laughs> Kissy, baby. Uh, love that guy. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, I think the you know everyone is itching for this freaking craziness to end. Um, it's going to be a different world when it does, but you know, uh, I think we'll find our way back to some semblance of of normalcy, whether it's a new normal or you know uh, other things. It, I, the, yeah, I mean, there's not a lot I can really say as far as what I've heard. Uh, just right. comfortable saying. No, no, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, don't it's, it's don't incriminate or uh, <laughs> yeah, <do> yeah. So. <laughs> uh, so let's let's dive through your your career. So when you started making, so you did film right for a while. I mean, I'm not minimizing film right because I still love watching. I watched oh, today man. even. Oh yeah. I even watched today. I was like, oh it's Joe Simon too. That garbage <laughs> show. <laughs> so when when you're doing film right, film right starting to evolve, you're starting to diversify at this yeah. point. And, and I 
uh, I mean, you, you, I mean, some people may not know, I, I don't know how, but that you also do music. Uh, you yeah. also have a love of comics. Uh, you uh, do filmmaking. Weird. No, uh, you do a lot of things and you started to diversify. What was the, what was the reasoning behind all of that? Uh, just a following my interests, really. Like it's just always been about, and it's what I always preach. Like if you're going to do a thing, be passionate about that thing. Otherwise don't do it. Um, you know, I, I, I love comics. I don't have the passion for comics to like do a show about it, but I love comics and I wanted a show about it. So I produced one and helped, you know, create one, but I found someone, you know, Eris Quinones, who is that yep. passionate about comics as I am about film. And I had him, you know, host it. And my brother, Tim is super deep into the geek world and loves all that stew too. So he's the executive producer running that show and everything. And, you know, it, it's, you, so it's, it's something under my banner because it was something that I felt was missing at the time that I wanted to see, which is exactly why I started Film Riot. It was something that I felt was missing that I wanted to see. Um, and that's kind of how I've chased everything. Music is just a love I've always had that my dad... <laughs> Wow, that's Josh. Great. He turned me on this Adobe stream we did the entire time. He called me a musician the whole time. <laughs> Friggin' Josh. Um, Josh. But yeah, my dad ingrained in mu music in all of his kids. Like every single one of us have a love for music, especially, you know, my, my brothers, Tim and, and Josh. Emily has a massive love for music. Um, but there's several musicians in my family. Uh, no one does it professionally, but all of us do it. Uh, as you know, heavy hobbies, uh, and you know, just sitting there playing and knowing if anybody tries to talk to them, they're just elsewhere now, like they're in some kind right. of <laughs> trance, you know? that kind of love of music. Um, but I've always, I, I really loved that. There was somebody who gave me terrible advice, and I completely ignored it. That said, a jack I'm sorry, I didn't know you I'm were good. Still pissed, bro. But it's, <laughs> he said, a jack of all trades is a master of none, and mm -hmm. I think that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, at least for me, uh, whereas for me is if you have a passion, chase it <clears throat> and slowly, but surely over time, that passion, you know, closed in and closed in and closed into where my number one focus was film riot, but I have several passions and all of those passions fed into, um, not film, right, but film. Um, but all of those passions ended up feeding into my filmmaking and you know, uh, teaching ended up becoming a passion that I never expected to have, but film riot and putting that stuff out, um, you know, teaching is a weird word because I don't really see it as teaching. I see it as more as just being honest about what we're doing and what we found. And so I guess just putting information out there, I guess educating, sure. Um, but that became a passion I never thought I was going to have. And that passion has taught me. It's given me a reason to dig deeper, try something new, figure something out I probably wouldn't have otherwise because we're going to do it for an episode ne next week. And that has fed into the machine that is you know, my personal filmmaking music is the same thing. Like music has this, uh, like ingrained, you know, pace and tempo and emotion that really does, uh, feed into, you know, storytelling as a whole. Um, so it's just, all <laughs> it's just, <laughs> gosh, Josh, you're the worst. <laughs> Uh, but it's uh, all you know, I'm promote uh, everything he says now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, and he knows uh, now too. Yeah, so until he posts the like, one, and then I'll be like, "No, you don't get it." What else can I say? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna like sign into the film and like just do counter things. What he <laughs> said. Just keep apologizing. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think all of those things. It's so just you know, diversifying has just been a part of just following passions. I mean, even our store was about the passion to the community that, you know, Film Riot had created, which again, wasn't, a, it, do, do we have another one coming? We have another one coming, got it. <laughs> oh, I hate him so much. Um, <laughs> but the store was about, you know, trying to, again, bring value to the community. Um, and, you know, while also trying to put another leg on the stool to keep the whole thing afloat as well, but yeah. I feel like it's a good time for a question now that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like working with family? <laughs> uh, awful. It's awful. I hate Josh. <clears throat> it's great, man. I, especially in the early days, it's like, <clears throat> 
no one, you know, no one has ever believed in me like my family has. They've they've always been and vice versa. Like, you know, I, you know, Tim, Josh, Eris, Emily, I think they could do anything they set their mind to. So it's it's and you get that with people, you know, like you go on a film set <clears throat> and by the end, you're kind of like a family holding each other up. You know, that the, with them, you know, obviously it's actual family. It's like square one stuff and, and people I can trust entirely. You know, Tim's the COO of Trying Films. He handles all things money and i don't have to think twice about it because i know you know he would take a bullet for me you know so it's like <clears throat> it it definitely helps quite a bit um just you know the being there for each other factor of it um and it's it's a lot of, it's it's easier just to be able to tell josh how dumb he is and then move on and neither of us care because we're brothers and of course he's just shut up you're an idiot and then we go back to work you know right um so you know that stuff is is great but also they know i can't fire them so that's tough <laughs> i mean i guess i could but thanksgiving would be weird <laughs> what what is your employment nepotism clause like because that's got to be pretty open at this point <laughs> You just as long as you're related in some way, you're in. Eris, <laughs> Eris, who hosts Variant, is actually married to my sister. Well, there you go. Yeah, uh -huh. it's, it's family. It's, uh -huh. it's... <laughs> it is we, funny we... how it definitely went the way of a family company because at <clears throat> at one point it was it was like 50 50. Now I think it's like you know 90 percent of the company is it's like a family company which it'll keep opening up and that'll that'll shift a little bit more but it's it's funny that it, it turned into uh, a family company which wasn't entirely purposeful i mean to some extent it was because it was like hey this would be a cool because you know my parents just made a bunch of creative people <laughs> so so it was like great oh you're good at this come come help do this so it's cool that it's like it's become something that has kept us together and kept us like you know being created together and, and working together. That's I mean f family is important and I, and I I I like to watch film right just by the fact that you have family that that shares interest. It's wild because I mean most families are just you know here and there and yeah. everywhere. They're all supportive, but I mean you have support and integrated support. It's it's wild. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Not uh, mad about it. Eric, yeah, right. Eric says he wants to bring back Pimp Your Production for three big reasons. <laughs> you know Cassie Baby's number. <laughs> yes! Dude, I always bring up Pimp Your Production. That was fun. The last episode we did for that was so the, much the, fun. It was so fun. Nobody messes with Kessler. I remember, I remember pitching that to him, and then he said yes, and I was like, wait, really? What? Can I really do that? <laughs> okay, but I'm I'm renting a private jet. And he's like, yeah, do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay so it's like, it kind of funny that the joke was that he gave me his credit card and i went nuts but that's kind of what happened it's, he just approved it a symbolic <laughs> thing yeah. and he just let i'm like i'm buying a suit of armor and he's like do it baby like, this is the best the, yeah, the first <laughs> time i saw it i was I like a llama in my backyard <laughs> It's well, so but weird. everyone should yeah. everyone should i mean yeah I mean, on, uh, on fridays but it was like a thursday it was crazy well, Wednesday's hump day, so that's camels. So <laughs> yeah, that's can't. camels. That's not llamas. That's oh, yeah, yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah, llamas. Is uh, uh oh, <laughs> llama. Oh, damn. Bigger budget. Can I can I grip for you? Um, <laughs> Bigger I'm budget. Have, my I'll, my, I'll my right favorite words. I, gotta, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got um, somebody. I got to call. Yeah. Wait, bye, Scott. Fifteen minutes. We're done. Two <laughs> private jets, Eric. <laughs> can I fly to the private jet in a fly yeah. private jet? Can we actually take off this time? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Where the hell were we? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> something about your life. No. Okay. So, Film Riot. Um, you're you're going through that, and you can see it's it's kind of fun to go watch. Um, ooh, I got the invite. <laughs> um, it's fun to watch how Film Riot has evolved because it literally looked like at the beginning you guys were just a bunch of guys, gals, and you know friends having fun trying yeah. to show some filmmaking at the in yeah. the in the process. And uh, oh, oh, damn it! I I mean I can't not post that. <laughs> I do you fly with a hot tub? I want to find out. <laughs> I'm gonna find out. It's just what I've ever wanted. <laughs> Um, so you're, um, you're, you're evolving from, I mean, cause originally y'all were doing gags all the time. Like the drinking, the milk was hilarious though. I don't know how that happened or 
why <laughs> it was literally just anything that popped in my head hey you know what we should do <laughs> we just did it. and i didn't no. have kids that tired me out so i was just always hyper so it kind of lent itself to the the madness of the show the 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 ice buckets were always great i i enjoyed that i uh oh i God. always thought that was fun but digressing 20 years um the you evolve from you know l- i mean you still always have the practical jokes at heart, but you kind of got more serious and more refined over the years. And then I've also noticed you from wanting to uh, be DP and cam op and, and writer to now you become more and more focused on directing and writing. What is your, like your evolved passion now? What is it that you want to do more than anything else? Write and direct features, man. Um, series too, but uh, features is my number one love. But like a, a short run series, I just see as like a really long feature. So that would be one too. But yeah, just writing, directing, and producing is it. And that's always been it. Um, when I started film right, I knew, you know, way before that, there were times where I had like moments of insecurity of like, ah, maybe I'm not a writer director. Maybe I'm, maybe I am just a DP because I'm a visual direct, very visual director. So there was right. one point where I was like, maybe I'm just a DP. Maybe I don't have what it takes to be a director. And, but that went away quickly of like, you know, the, I just can't not, I have to express myself in this way. Um, so that was always the target I've been throwing darts at, you know, that bullseye I've been trying to hit my entire career. And so Editing, I thought I would edit my own films for a long time. Um, that was something that evolved, but everything else was just a factor of necessity, not the thing I wanted to do. Like I love cinematography, but I don't want to be the cinematographer. I mean, I, I want to do the visual things that the director does. I love picking lenses. I love knowing where the camera needs to go. And then I love collaborating with somebody who's going to help achieve that vision and bring their ideas to the table, you know, like Chase did with ballistic and um, there comes a knocking, like he brings a whole nother level of things, you know, Ryan Booth with, uh, um, uh, ghost house and stuff like that. I always talk about like some of the, Hey, what if we just did this instead of that? And it was like, Oh, that's, that accomplished the same goal, but it's a thousand times better. You know, <clears throat> those are the collaborations I always wanted to have. It took me a while to get there because of confidence and just also building, you know, work for myself to be like, Hey, this is what I've done. Do you want to, and even when we did uh proximity, <clears throat> That was because a much larger project fell through. It was a $300,000 short film that on a Friday, you know, it's like, oh, we're not doing it. And then uh, from the Monday, we were about to shoot it. So it just, and, and man, I'm so happy it didn't have it because it didn't happen because I don't, I think I was biting off more than I could chew. I think we would have finished it. <clears throat> and I think we would have had something. I don't think it would have been bad but if i wanted it to be a 10 it it may be uh, six maybe (laughs) you know it was just too much um and it was an insane education that taught me that but that moved us into proximity so it became like the best possible like way that that could have gone so i got this insane education of really trying to put this thing together which didn't happen and taught me more by not happening than it ever would have taught me by happening. And then that pushed us into doing proximity. So instead of having a full crew and a DP, I was the full crew and the DP and, and uh, Justin Robinson was there. It was the first time I ever met him and he was helping out with like camera and stuff. And, and then it was just like family and friends helping out. It's like, well, who do I have that could be in this? You know what? Well, we have an empty field. I have a friend who makes like cosplay costumes. Could you make me these shackles? You know? Okay, sure. And then, and we just went and did it. And um, so, so that was something that was born of necessity. And I love that short film to this day. Uh, It's one of my favorite that I've done. Um, but it wasn't because I wanted to be the DP is because I had to be. Uh, and then <clears throat> as soon as I could bring people in, I did um, uh, because I love collaborating. You know, I love having the vision and being able to express myself, but I love bringing people together and unifying that vision that then it becomes, you know, a choir to, it's not a solo performance. Like the whole auteur thing I think is the most BS of any like concept ever. Like, yes, it's, it's a singular vision, but it's not like <clears throat> somebody's doing the music. Somebody's the cinematographer. Somebody's grading that thing. You're guiding it, but there's, there's somebody else singing your words, you know? Um, so yeah, it's an not- orchestra, 
is only as good as the, every member in there. I mean, exactly. everybody has to play a part, including yeah. the conductor who just exactly. leads them doing their part. It's, yeah, that's exactly right. So it's like that, that stuff drives me nuts. Um, and I, I love that collaboration. So film riot was just, you know, something that, um, has taught me and that has been what I've been doing leading towards where I want to go, but that's where we all started, right? Like every friend that I had started doing every position cause he had to, it's just, we never saw it. And that gotcha. was one of the ideas of film, right? Like what if, what if I just fail constantly for however many years it takes me to story of my life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just put it out there, you know, do yep. it in front of everyone fail constantly and horribly make you go back like, nine you go back five years stuff that we it looks so bad it's so bad but it's like you're doing it week after week and uh it was just such an education and i think it's really cool that and and even uh this kid emailed me he's like this 15 year old filmmaker kid and he's going he's binging film right right now and he even talks about it, like how cool it is to go back and see us so young see josh so young josh is starting to come into his own as a filmmaker and watch that progression and see that oh 10 years later this guy still hasn't made a feature, but he's getting closer. And that's just the 10 years you've seen, let alone everything else that has happened. So that's always been, a you know, something that's been exciting to be about film, right? But the, again, the target has always been writing and directing. It's just been a very conscious effort of, you know, building the experience um, and educating myself to where, like I always say, eventually I could look someone in the eye and be like, you know, you can bet on me because <laughs> it always is a gamble, no matter what, no matter who's doing it. The greatest filmmakers in the world have made bad films. Um, I, or, like, I always respected, <laughs> and, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming that many people are in the same boat where, you know, as a creator, we're completely insecure about our work. Oh, and I respect <laughs> it that you put it out there. You're like, screw it. I'm putting it out there. And I'm sure you were fighting through insecurities the whole time, oh, but man. you did it. And it was a brave thing to do. And I mean, it literally inspired. I told you the first time I met you how much you inspired me to put it all out there. One day I'm going to do it. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's, it is, I mean, yeah, you were, you were not as good as you are today. I'm trying to be nice how to say the proper things, but I sucked. <laughs> <laughs> you put it out there and you progressed and people grew and watched that if you keep going, you will get better just by doing a thing over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks, man. And, and and I'm glad that that, that came across because that really was the hope, even from the beginning of, you know, <clears throat> I knew some people and I knew of some things and, it's, and it just felt like everything was so tight to the chest. Everything was like an Instagram filter. And it's like, I, you know, <laughs> no, never. Um, everything was like a, an Instagram filter. Uh, Batman was a little bit Scooby Doo. It was like it was like <laughs> weird Batman, but it was really like it was like Batman, but it was like Scooby Doo. You know, <laughs> it was like it was. Weird. It was it was late night Batman. Is really what it was. <laughs> no, it, was it was three whiskeys in Batman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Forty lanes. Um, but yeah, uh, I just I, I just never saw the use in that because it's also like <clears throat> even even just for me, you know, I found I'm I'm I hate public speaking like this stuff doesn't bother me so, so much because it you know I've I've gotten much better at it over the years. It used to horrify me, but I remember like just five years ago I had to do like a panel for Adobe and it was just the panel. It was a Q and A, and I, I could that. not that moment uh morning i <clears throat> i almost threw up like i was i was like flush i was they were like you want water i was like give me nothing i am going to buy like i'm real. i get shaky i always tell them like to this day i'm like i don't want a microphone because if i hold the microphone i know this will happen because when i get nervous i like i immediately shake i don't know why um, even if I'm like, I'm only a little nervous, but I'm good. My hands shake. And if I, and if I know people can see, oh, his hands are shaking. He's so nervous. That's going to make me more nervous. Like I'm going to get in my own head about it. <clears throat> but in those times, what I've discovered is my, the defense to that is to not pretend like, you know, your hot stuff or whatever it is. Uh, just be honest. And like, I'm really nervous right now. Like there's been several times where I'm like, I'm so nervous right now. I'm just honest. Yeah, my hands are a little shaky. I'm so nervous to be up here right now. And now everybody knows we're in this together. You're not trying to pretend to be better than you are. You're not trying to pretend to be less nervous than you are. You know, and with my DPs even, that was like when I worked with Ryan Booth for the first time. He was the first time I worked with a DP. I was super nervous because... 
he's an incredibly talented yeah, artist and talented. worked with like some cool people doing some awesome stuff and it's just like first time I, and i was so nervous about it so i just told them like hey man i'm nervous i've never done this you know be patient with me i haven't worked with it i'm used to being my own you know tell me when i'm doing stuff that's annoying to you um this is going to be a great learning experience to me you know even with my actors every time <clears throat> every time without fail that uh i do something it's like you know let's talk afterwards what how did i help you how did i not what was annoying what could i do better i want to know those things um because it's always a learning experience. And I just think being honest takes the edge off. And, you know, it's just more helpful to you and to whoever might be watching or even just a part of whatever that thing is. I think I think your, your human side, we'll put it that way, because you don't Not come off. Android side. You, I no, you, you come off as a machine, let's be honest. Um, and <laughs> I'm plugged in right now. It was, it was last the two hours. It was right before that Adobe panel that I first met you for the first time, and you were standing. Really? Yeah, you were walking to to uh, to Kessie Baby's booth, and mm -hmm. I I saw you from behind. I was like, "Who is that?" Mm -hmm. No, I, everybody. I, I recognized behind that. Yeah, I recognized <laughs> your your hair was was it, and I I kind of uh -huh. walked up and said hello. And I mean, you were very shy and and like you know hey how's it going hey. exactly yeah. and i was like yeah. oh my god he's human i did not expect that i <laughs> 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 yeah i got better at that too like uh in the early days i'm like oh did i just come off as an asshole because i i am like i mean it, it doesn't seem like it on the show and stuff but i am very introverted um like it is somebody i i think i posted it to uh, instagram stories like deacon said on his podcast like um, that he feels very awkward and uncomfortable in like group settings. And I'm like, oh my God, it's so nice to hear, you know, the God of cinematography uh, saying that when that's exactly how I feel. You know, it's like, I feel if it's not film, if it's not, if we're not talking movies, I'm like, I don't know what to say to you, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> but over time, like Film Ride has been really helpful. Me and Josh talk about that a lot. Like I've been pitching a lot lately and stuff and all the podcasts doing stuff like this, doing stuff like NAB, you know, meeting people that I've never met before, like, you know, you over and over and over and over again. That has really helped me break out of my shell. Wait, wait, meeting me over and over again? That sounded creepy. What, well, what, those are just my uh, dreams. I'm not I'm stalking, like, like... <laughs> despite what the court order says. <laughs> Stop coming to my house, Scott. <laughs> That's right. Why did you send me cookies? That is disgusting. Is <laughs> the cookies. That's right. Everyone yeah. in the office enjoyed that one. Those were delicious. And, and I, I'm going to send you more, but I'm trying to wait until I feel like people will be at the office. <laughs> so, <laughs> Because I'm always like watching, I mean, stalking your schedule. I'm like, well, he's over here or they're over here. So there's no way they're together. So yeah. I don't want to send cookies. And then like Emily's like, they're all mine. Yeah, we got a few people at the office now um, because it's literally just family. Um, and it's just a handful of people. So that's that's starting to happen a little bit. And I'm going to get over there eventually. I just haven't had time even, even if I wanted to, to like disconnect <clears throat> the setup I have here to reconnect it there. Cause that's like an hour right. out of my day. Once I'm you do it, you do it. Yep. Yeah. And I just don't have that extra hour or two currently, which is, you know, nuts. no cookies. Why? What if that's we probably Batman thing. Good? <laughs> no, no cookies, no cookies. Oh, I don't, I don't even have Oreo problem. problems or Chip Ahoy, Chip Ahoy. That was what it was. I didn't, there's, we've done so many, I think it's like 900 and uh josh keeps track of this not me he josh pretty much runs film right now it's josh like put it down below 40 something episodes i don't know we're getting wow close to so what are you doing for a thousand or i mean what josh what are you doing for a thousand yeah there you go that's better <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh I, I don't know we we've talked about it on and off um we, we, we got to figure something out but um, three jets with a hot tub so many episodes <laughs> and it's so often that we'll like have to go back for something for an episode or a fan will send us an episode or something and then we'll watch it and we'll be like i do not do you remember doing this because especially back in the day when we used to have so many random cutaways which i do miss um <clears throat> but I think I think those stuff will start finding their way back in. Josh is going to start hosting more and more and taking over more and more, uh, which I think is interesting because Josh is, uh, you know, uh, you know, a writer director in the making as well, just like myself. And he's, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, more like me from a few years ago. So we're going to start incorporating that a lot more to where you're going to have that like 
you know, old school vibe. Cause also he's younger and he still has that energy where it's like, that's one of the reasons why you see like how you said the show has like evolved in that direction. Is right. because, you know, uh, which I tell Josh all the time. I'm, I don't want to try to be something, you know, when it's, when it's weird and it's funny, it's cause we're actually just in a hyper mood. Um, otherwise it's, you know, what's currently going on. Like we did the writing episode. <clears throat> we did a writing episode recently, not about writing, but getting into the process of writing. And that's because that's something I've been really working on over the past two years. And most specifically the past like six months, like heavily. Um, so that's been something that's really heavily on my mind and what I'm currently going through. And, and that's kind of what I've always wanted film right to be is, is tracking the things that we're currently going through and doing and not plucking out like, Oh, people want to see a flash effect. So let's do that. And we'll do that stuff. Like when we think, Oh, this will be fun to try you know, things that we're excited about, but, um, that's kind of why the show's tone has evolved. And I think, um, I think we'll start seeing a lot more weirdness as Josh and Emily start taking more of you know that place uh a darker side to film right <laughs> yeah they're out of their mind crazy still so i think we're gonna start getting more of that again which i'm excited about um so on the the writing side and the creativity side and and i mean that one is is it's a struggle for everyone especially me how do you put yourself in a mode to write <clears throat> what what Man, that's the hard part. Um, it it it's it's tough. It's getting easier over time because it's almost like um, I almost feel like it, at first it was like finding where I needed to go without GPS, you know. And now I have GPS at least. You know what I mean? <laughs> so originally it was just like I think if I take a left here, I'll get to because I would always tell my wife like it was frustrating because ninety percent of writing for me was getting in the mode to be able to write. And especially when I was writing <clears throat> the feature version of There Comes a Knocking, uh, it was the first feature I wrote. So it, it, tons of learning curves for me there and, and figuring out that process and and also just, you know, fighting to have the confidence to write the next page when it just feels insurmountable, you know, this massive beast to undertake. Um, uh, so like, you know, a huge portion of it was just getting into the tone because it is a much darker tone. Like you, if you've seen the short film, oh yeah, there's no jokes, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a very, which is weird yeah. for you, <laughs> but, but also not, but I get it. Um, but you know, so, so finding my way into that honest emotion to be able to then write honestly was the hardest part. And there were days where it was like half the day was spent just finding the pocket and then once i got the majority of the writing i did was in an hour and i was there for six you know <clears throat> whereas now it, it's it's i feel like the toolbox is filling up with the tools that help me get there a little bit quicker um but it's difficult i mean music obviously just like everybody i, I always get a lot of imagery um i posted some on film right i forget the name of the other you did now. an episode that yeah you, you create playlists and yes. you, you play yeah yeah yeah, but um, I, I'm not a fan. I'm just saying, <laughs> I find artwork that kind of represents the tone, not like what the film right. literally look like or anything, but like what it feels like, like what the thematic underscore of the piece feels like. Like when you're watching it, what should you be feeling? And I'll find pieces that give me, you know, pieces of artwork that or photography or whatever that give me that feeling. Or I'll watch portions of movies that give that feel. Not not like I'm watching a horror movie. It's you know like a you know the seven has that bleak you know feel to it watching moments of that you, to help you kind of find that sort of emotional pocket do, i mean do you wake up in the morning and go today i'm going to write a horror or or do you have are, are you one of those <laughs> <laughs> filmmakers Every who's like day, scott <laughs> <laughs> it's never gonna happen are you one of those those filmmakers who wakes up in the middle of the night and writes down the idea or the dream you just had is that last night uh it's rarely a dream that's happened to me a couple of times usually i'm laying it's in a bed dream and, it's a dream usually i'm laying in bed and um as i'm falling asleep i'm always thinking about film or story or something and and an idea will pop in my head and then i'll write it down before i fall asleep um so that's my late night write down i get tons of ideas in the shower 
uh, that's like my idea yeah. hub. You, so, you said that the other day and I'm like, damn it. I just came up with an idea in the shower yeah. and you ruined it for me now. <laughs> my wife, it's funny because uh, whenever I'm like, it's the middle of the day and I'm like, hey, I'm going to go take a shower. She's like, oh, you need an idea? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I always come out and she's like, you got it? I'm like, I got it. <laughs> it's It just works. It's just this very focused place. It's great. Um, so Josh, I'm picturing a, a uh, nice scene here. <laughs> he's 40 years have progressed. He never leaves the shower. Think of the Seinfeld episode where he's doing everything in the get, shower. I need to get a waterproof laptop and I'll be set. <laughs> <laughs> they make them. They do. Four yeah, filmmakers. It just, you know, uh, you know, ideas spark in different ways at different times. Like the, the concept of, you know, uh, uh, I'm just thinking of concepts I can't say now. You know, a concept of, uh, you know, bring dinosaurs back. Oh, interesting. What could that be? You know, and it starts with that thing that maybe it's an article of this, you know, thing that you read that's like, oh, that's interesting. What could that be? And then, and you know what? I, I found that has been really interesting because I've been writing really, really fast lately, especially just churning out different treatments really, really fast. And <clears throat> I found while well, I was talking to Josh and I'm like, I know why that is. It's because I have uh, like an Evernote and Google Docs and Apple Notes filled with ideas okay. for the last 25 years. You know what I mean? That was my next question is you just scroll and you're like, yeah. that does sound so, good. Yeah. So, and I've always written those ideas down. And then as I moved from paper to digital and then from files of word documents or text documents into like Evernote or Google, I just keep transferring them and keeping them. So it ends up being like, um, just this list of ideas and it's because it's like oh here's an idea for a movie and then a year later i'm like god that sucked but hey that one idea is really cool and then you end up coming up with eventually like oh this is a movie this is this is great this is this is a movie it's and now i need all these ideas to fill out that movie and then you have this catalog of ideas that you can then pull from again from the last like 15 years <laughs> and it's funny because they're in like chronological order of life and you're like oh look this is the harry potter phase oh yeah okay okay <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah i've got the i've got the same call you know, I, I find that interesting because I, I always wonder how other people get inspired to do things yeah because right? i mean I, i've probably asked that question 74 times on your your question and answer but and you never take my question. But I got to answer. <laughs> I think. I think too. I, I think too. It's like it's also experience, and you know, I the the filmmaker that everybody has seen put forward isn't the entire picture of the filmmaker that I am. Um, you know, because I don't see short films as this me telling you a complete story. Let's really dive in. I'm going to tell you the whole story. I I just don't. It's, it's short format and my brain doesn't work that way. So I've always seen sh short films as something plucked from a greater whole, something with a lot of, you know, leave it ambiguous and let the audience wonder. And a part of that thinking was even like, I want to make features. I would love to make a feature version of this short film. So if I leave it open enough and I give you enough because plus I really like to play in that world like you know annihilation things like that where it's not spoon feeding you and you get to go man what was that about why'd they do this why'd they do that and there's enough there for you to like bring your own brush to the canvas um, and I, I love that kind of storytelling is specifically in short films features you know I, I like to leave things open I don't like to spell things out but it's all there short films less so and that's proven to be true. All the short films where I left it very open and people were pissed off that it's like, this isn't a short film, this is an action <laughs> sequence, are the ones where producers contacted me being like, hey, what is this? What's the feature version of this? What's this world? Um, and so that's kind of always been, because again, I want to make, fe I don't want to make a career of short films. I want to make a career of features. I'm trying to, but the backgrounds are so gorgeous. My eyes keep drifting. I think uh, we're battling here. We do have colored LEDs going on a lot. I just have the Jaws. I, I was going to put up. The 45th anniversary of Jaws coming out, which I think is like June 2nd, which is crazy. 45 years. I anyway. was going to put up the signed poster that I got from oh. the movie you didn't make. I have like 12 of your posters, but the one I was like, oh, is it going to be worth more? But then if I put it up there, people would be like, oh my God, he's so playing to it. I don't <laughs> play to my audience. I don't. No, do it, baby. I love it. <laughs> I have both. Those are some of my favorite posters that Adam Rabelais did for, for me. He's done all my posters. Really yeah. good. So the gorgeous. Outsiders. I, I have them up in my office to stay. I love them. I, I've yeah, seen them around periodically in some yeah. of the, like the tours. 
Yeah. The and drug- Outsiders is never going to happen. It, it was like an offshoot of, it, it was going to be the closest I ever would have gotten to a fan film. It was like when I was really in love with Walking Dead and I was thinking like, well, what's going on in another part of the world? Like, and that's kind of what Outsiders was, was like, it, it was the same scenario elsewhere. And then they ended up doing the show. What was it? Was the show called where it's, it's kind of the same thing? The, well, there's uh, actually a show the- now called The Outsiders, <laughs> oddly enough. Oh yeah, and uh, the, yeah, and there's the show. Um, but we got like a an unofficial go ahead from uh, from some people uh, where it was never going to be official, but they were like, "Yeah, totally, um, uh, do it." Um, so yeah, but so so that'll never happen. But there are a lot of I just like I was saying before, there's a lot of ideas that I really love um, from that script that I wrote because it was like a I think it was like 28 pages, something like that. And there's a ton of ideas, character ideas, moments, turns, um, set pieces that I really love from it that I have since plucked and put into other things that I'm working on right now. So it's like those ideas are never wasted. You know, those those right. those, those little houses you built are never wasted. You can always reuse that material. So you get up in the morning, you, I'm going to write a horror and you jump in the shower and you think of all the horror. I scurry off to the shower. I just picture that little kid in the background. People dying. You're that little, that little kid in the background of that news reporter who was at home. Yes. I keep talking about that on different like uh, shows and stuff that happened to me while I was on a video call with someone uh, that I didn't want it to happen to me on. And in in my daughter, and she's just like, <clears throat> and luckily the person I was talking to was, it was going super well and we were hitting it off and, and they were super awesome about it. And I'm just like, this is my daughter. And she's like, hi. And she just kind of hung out for the rest of the call. <laughs> so, it is what it is. But I, I thought, you know what? If this person didn't react well to that, it's probably not the type of person I would want to work right. with. And they, you, you're they testing them amazingly well to it. And they thought she was adorable and they were super sweet about it. And it was like, yeah. I so like you, tr- you trot into your shower and you, you got it going full blast, full steam. Cause you know, full steam ahead. Jump You're- right back to the shower. <laughs> I'm just picturing you in the shower. I know you're really like <laughs> just that one time you were singing in that one episode. Oh, da, 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 da. I don't like my girlfriend. Was that? <laughs> oh my gosh. That's right. You I did that. Know. I'm only bringing oh, back all these episodes Oh, and I for you. was in the shower. Oh, that's and then you hilarious. got that like really high-pitched voice that I don't know how you did. I don't know that <laughs> anymore. It's a gift. Well, for now. <laughs> okay, so you, you pull your, your waterproof in laptop in there, and you're scrolling through all your lists. You, you've got the idea. You, you've got the snippet of an idea that you wrote down. How do you flush those ide- that idea out into a full-fledged, uh, you know, something you could actually write? What? It, it's kind of like where I'm at now and I'm sure it'll keep evolving because what I do now is, is similar to what I did a year ago, but definitely has evolved. And I, <laughs> Oh, Eric, like you're not thinking the same thing. Come on. <laughs> He's like, I've got all the posters. <laughs> yeah. You love you some Ryan bod. Don't lie. <laughs> um, mm. uh, but uh, it, it's definitely evolved and refined and, you know, I'm still just starting out in this aspect of things. So it's definitely going to keep revolving and refining, which is exciting because I'll keep sharing that on, on film, Riot As I discovered new stuff of how I do my personal process. (laughs) 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 Noise. Um, We've ruined showers forever. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But it's, you know, it, it, it happens in different ways where some has come from like a thematic idea. Some has come from like a character arc. Uh, a lot of them have come from a concept that I like. I've, I've noticed a lot, uh, a lot of uh, like there comes a knocking was, was kind of a concept with a theme attached um, because, you know, they were married. And so that film is very, very much driven by theme, um, which makes it a little bit harder to sell, but <clears throat> um, it, it, they all spark in different ways. But once it has sparked, then it's got to be like, you know, who is this about? Why does it have to be about them? I don't remember who said that. I heard somebody say it. It's not my original thought, obviously. Almost none of this is. Um, <clears throat> but a writer said that, and I was like, yes, like 
that's been the thing that I've, I've, I haven't been able to articulate, but I kind of felt and I couldn't really, you know, spell it out for even myself as a subconscious thing. And it was not only did I want to figure out who this thing was about, what they were going through and, and why I gave a shit that they were going through it, but why did it have to be specifically about them? Like the story has to be about them. They, this is the person that this has to be happening to. Why? Um, and, and figuring that out <clears throat> is, is what leads into getting, cause then once I have like who it's about and the concept, then theme starts to take shape. And I've noticed, I'll just start writing down ideas. I, you know, I won't be too harsh on myself, um, to, you know, to be like intellectual or then be great ideas. It's like, mm, this could be cool. Da, 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 da. You know, Oh, a tank. Why not? Tanks in it now. And uh, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> and I just write down all the ideas and then slowly, but surely the good ideas stay and the bad ideas get deleted. And, <clears throat> and then subconsciously this thing's the, well, this thing starts taking shape and subconsciously I was filling in theme without knowing it because it is your voice and you know, you are writing your experience and things that strike you without you knowing it or not. So sometimes if I don't fully have a grasp on what the theme is, you know, I'm just chasing down the, well, who's this about and why, and what are the ideas? And then eventually I'm like, Oh my God, all of this fits into this. Th it's about this. Like this is the theme. All of this fits in that I'm writing this and didn't realize it till just now. And I discover the theme that I was writing and didn't know it. Um, and then once I have that, that starts really being my guiding force, like the North star that brings everything together and, and leads me to what that inevitable ending is going to be, because you want to write, wrap up, of course, the plot, but more importantly to me, I want to wrap up the character and I want to wrap up the theme and I want to try to climax all those things at the same time. So it's like, well, what is that ending? What is that inevitable thing that we're headed toward that will also be, you know, satisfying, and then figuring that out. And, and then once I have my beginning, my middle and my end, then I start filling it out in beats. And I do like uh, how Blake uh, Snyder thinks about things like uh, the Save the Cat. I'm most definitely oh, not cat. religious about it. Um, <clears throat> and honestly, I, I a lot of my process was built around it and I didn't know it. Um, I read it like, I don't even know, like nine years ago eight years ago, something like that and forgot all about it. But I guess it really struck a chord with me because what I do now is very much that. And then Ricky Staub, my friend who just did a, uh, he just wrote and directed a film with Idris Elba. He is a big fan of uh, Save the Cat. And <laughs> that, there it is. That's what it was. <laughs> Josh, all the Josh is patrolling me, man. <laughs> this is true. Let's, let's, hey, Josh, is your bladder recovered? <laughs> but um but uh, he had me like uh, kind of dive back in and read it again and i was kind of shocked at how much like i was like yes that that and it's not all like dead on that but there's a lot of it that's similar to what i do but that that's why i like things like uh story and save the cat and script notes the podcast and just listening to people who um are worth listening to and hearing what their process is and then building your process out of that, like what makes sense, what drives you forward. People get really hot under the collar about like structure and stuff like that. And, you know, if you're if you're adhering to structure, blah, blah, blah. And then you're like, well, every film has one. <laughs> oh, my mic went away. Um, you know, even if you're not thinking about, oh, it's bladder recovered. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank God. Oh, so weird. <laughs> Woo! Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's for me, it's not about <clears throat> adhering to like a three act structure. I don't think in terms of three acts, but I do think in terms of five or six, depending on the story, because it makes sense to me. And I know of a few people who think that way, but I don't know how many do, um, but it makes sense to me and it helps drive forward the story. But once I have a layout, I'm really not thinking about that anymore. It's about feeling the pacing of the thing and the characters and you know, getting feedback of this part's a little slow, tighten it up. And, and then once you're done with it and you sit back and you analyze it, there's a structure there just because it inherently, I think, I think Craig Mason's the one that even talked about this or, or was it the Pixar folks? I can't really remember. Even if you don't pay attention to structure, really good storytelling ends up being structured. 
because right. it's really good storytelling. A setup and a payoff, that's a structure. Uh, you know, a magic trick has a structure. A joke has a structure. Not mine. Mine are really bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it doesn't have to be like this religious thing. Um, and it certainly isn't for me. And that's what's been helping is especially allowing myself to not um, be be on that. Like, uh, it has to be this. This is the one way to do it has been a, a really useful thing for me. Are you working on like one thing at a time, like hyper focused no. on it until you just burn out, or do you have like seventeen different things going on and you just kind of move to them? Or seventeen, and, really? Seventeen at all times. Wow. I've created. Like, <laughs> um, I can't not like if 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 I have one thing that I'm doing on one thing only, I can't focus. But if I do multiple things, then I can. I always have something that's front and center, the front burner thing. This is the thing that's most likely to go and have movement, which I have right now. And then like, I even have like folder structure. I have my writing, then I have my treatments, then I have my idea developments. And then I have like my ideas. You've got desktop, old desktop, old, old desktop. Right, right. <laughs> totally. I literally have a folder on my desktop, desktop right now. <laughs> but it's like, you know, the thing that I'm currently actively writing, the things that I'm building treatments out for, the things that are the ideas that I'm developing that will be treatments next. And then the things that are ideas, but I don't have enough behind those ideas to really fully develop, but they're ideas that I'm constantly, and those are constantly being filled out. And they're things that are in there that have been in there for like 15 years that I <laughs> haven't been able to touch it. And then they just move up to the thing. So there's always like right now there's one, two, uh, three, four, five. So there's six things I'm working on right now. So there's wow. always around that where, <clears throat> and then you have like the ideas that you'll just jump back into and be like, Oh, here's something for that. Um, but you know, some people hyper focus. Uh, I wish I could. It'd probably go faster, but I I can't. Especially, I find it really useful too. Like when, like the thing I'm currently writing, I you know I'll get stuck on, and if I feel I continue to feel stuck, I'll give myself a break and jump over to one of the other ones, one of the back burner ones, which allows me to like take some time away from that idea. And sometimes I'll I'll find you know things in in that process as well. So what, what what point when you're developing an idea do you bring in like some of your 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 friends or your your trusted uh, advisors so to speak uh, when do you share those ideas with them like right off the bat or you're in the shower you're like hey dude I got this great idea or I mean <laughs> do you have it like really formed out and then you share or do you ask ahead of time it's it's layered <clears throat> over time I've built like um like levels of people that I show things to at different points. So there's people that I say things like my wife hears every idea once it comes into my brain, you know, which Whether I'm she wants to or not. <laughs> yeah. She's like, Ryan, this is completely She's inappropriate. Like, you know, doing something, mm -hmm, that's good, honey. That's great. Can, you. can you just make your own cereal without an idea? Right, and do something with the kids. And I'm like, and then <laughs> uh -huh. Ooh, I I too, I later. <laughs> and what if we take away the toy? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she's she's great. She's extremely the most patient human I've ever met in my life. Um, and I've gotten better at waiting till my ideas are a little more formed where I can articulate them better because I I've had a really uh, you know bad you know track of like getting overly excited and impatient and just telling my ideas too early to where it's like because and that can be dangerous too because even people who get you and like i think you know my brother josh is one of the people that get my ideas and me like extremely well and if i tell him an idea too early he's like um okay but that i know like there's something you know what i mean like you have that idea that you just know like there's something about it you feel it you're like no this is badass I just can't convey to you why it's going back to that doing plays for my family in the living room and them not getting it, but then getting the camera and then they do get it because they're seeing it through. You know, I'm not at that point to where I could let him see what I'm seeing. Um, so I've gotten a little better at holding back until I know, okay, now I can show you one. And then there's the just the verbal pitch of, you know, this. And so there's some people that get that. And then there's the initial rough treatment. And some people will get that. And I get notes from that. Um, and the, the people that came before will always get the next level thing too. The people who are kind enough to give me that much of their time. Um, and then it just goes up like that bit by bit by bit. I mean, same thing with an edit. When I'm working on an edit, I have those layers, the very rough, the rough, the more polished, you know, um, 
because it's just helpful. Because if everybody sees the very rough, then they're already tainted by the very rough when you get three versions down. And that kind of goes with, you know, every aspect of it for me. Comedy horror are those your two favorites or are they just what you happen to write easiest or I mean, or is comedy not at all i don't i i have one comedic idea that's it <laughs> um film riots comedy and i love doing comedy but when it comes to like features and stuff, especially i never watch comedy which is very odd what um, yeah never and everybody's always if i watch a comedic right. well thanks for your time ryan i appreciate <laughs> If I watch a comedic film, it's because the people that I'm that I'm with want to watch it. Or, or you told me it was a horror, honey. Why did you yeah, lie? Like, like Frighteners. Frighteners is like, uh, you know, a uh, comedic horror film that I will watch on my own, like that stuff. But I, I did not straight up comedy. It's it yeah, it's extremely rare. Um, which so is so. Where does your comedy come from? I mean, I've always loved comedy. I've always been like a goofball. I've always loved making people laugh. Um, and I do love making people laugh and I would love to make a comedy. I have, I do have a com one comedic idea that I think would be very funny and I definitely want to do. Um, but with comedy, I really love the immediate, uh, you know, uh, reaction of it. Like right. I I've done like live performance stuff in the past and getting that immediate on uh, audience laughter or showing video live, um, and get immediate uh, laughter or film riot where you put it up and you get immediate comments on it. And right. you know, so that stuff or showing it to my family members and have, um, <clears throat> so, you know, that, and I, I would definitely do comedy. It, you know, it would just have to be, it's, you know, uh, so it's, it's more kind of just natural in your, in your, your, your body yeah. that you just yeah, like to be I mean, comedic. I I don't know who said, I think it was Craig Mazin who, who again, bringing up Craig Mazin again, uh, who said Craig like, Mason. if you're not funny in real life, you're probably not going to be funny on paper, you know? And, you know, I've always just been a hyperactive nutcase, just like Josh and Emily and, and, you know, that stuff just comes out naturally in film, right? And the films I want to make, there's some films that are far more bleak. And I think that's a part of me exploring what I don't understand, you know, the world's a, a really shitty place in a lot of ways, and, you know, especially right. right now with a lot of stuff that's going on and, you know, exploring that of like, how can, you know, how can we be such monsters? You know, how can someone, you know, be beautiful one minute and horrendous the next? And so that's what I love about horror is, you know, exploring what is horrific in our actual everyday life. Uh, that's just you know, for the normal you know, human being, it's hard to understand. And then, um, you know, comedy is just inherent in me. My dad's a goofball too. And so I have a lot of even action ideas and stuff. There's a comedic sensibility to it. So if it's not like super bleak because it needs to be, there is a comedic tone. Like there comes a knocking, although it is very dark, there's a very comedic tone to the characters. They do have um, sort of, you know, a dialogue like I do uh, where it's very sarcastic and, and um, you know, stupid things are said but but while you know it's also taking itself seriously but a, a straight comedy i just have one idea which is also a horror comedy so it's not a straight comedy <laughs> so i guess i have no straight comedy ideas i guess if your life is a comedy you don't need to watch comedies it's more... exactly <laughs> <laughs> so do so i mean you are constantly posting uh the films that you watch and you're yeah. you're, you're you, you give all kinds of insight into what you thought about it and such. Um, so you're watching horrors or what? I mean, you'd clearly watch a lot of stuff, but what do you, what are you looking for, for inspiration from other movies? What? Uh, just a good movie, man. Like, you know, um, right now I went with, when all this stuff kicked off, it was like, it was stressing me out pretty, you know, uh, pretty heavily. Um, and so I just wanted like all of a us metric buttload metric buttload. And so, <laughs> you know, I was looking for things that would, you know, let me chill out for a minute at the end of the day. And, you know, I'm a, a good horror I'm a really kid of the just... age of the 90s. Oh, no. <laughs> good horror. Well, no, I didn't watch horror for a little <laughs> while. Um, it, uh, I, I'm a child of the eighties and nineties. So I just went on this nineties spree because I love action nineties action. And that's kind of, that's how it started was going down. Just, I was just watching nineties action films, like die hard with a vengeance, the rock, you know, bad boys, uh, broken arrow, executive decision, yep. you know, all these movies that, and it's funny going back and rewatching them, how much, even though I haven't seen these movies in God knows how long, how much they've influenced me. And I'm seeing things that's like, that's where I got that, you know, which is really interesting. But that's how it started. 
And then it just stuck in the 90s. And my brother's girlfriend is the one who said it. Donnie has told said was like, you know, it's it that nostalgia is comforting to you. And I'm like, that's it. It's that nostalgia of the 90s that like ripping back to that time when you were younger and you know, going to film the the theater with your friends and that feeling it gives you. So it's just been very comforting. But then you know, re-watching these films that I already have like a deep love and knowledge of lets me explore them in different ways. And and even in, when they are a little bit silly, like The Rock or whatever, there's still a lot to be taken from them and there's a history to them. So it's also very educational, which is why I continue to post them is because it, it forces me to watch them in a more educational way um like tombstone there's a bunch of stuff i learned about tombstone that i didn't know otherwise about how kurt russell actually directed the film and i had heard a little bit about that before that came out a little while ago but a little bit more about of how that you know that dude bled for the film like it exists thanks to him there was a time where because wider kevin <clears throat> kevin costner's wider film was happening too and kevin costner was really powerful in the hollywood system at the time so he was straight up blocking tombstone everywhere they turned so the only place that would take tombstone was buena vista so buena vista had power to ask for things so um willem dafoe was originally going to be doc holiday but because he was in jesus christ superstar that was a little controversial so they didn't want him in that role so they had to shift gears and go with someone else thank god they did with val kilmer because that's like one of the most iconic roles ever which i'm sure willem dafoe would have been amazing but we got that val kilmer uh, just best performance of his career easily. But, you know, finding those things out, it's like, it's illuminating in so many different ways. So it's like watching it in this way of this film that you've seen a ton, you know the story, but you're watching it with the these more educated filmmaker eyes and really looking at why they did what they did and how this went down. And, and when you know a little bit more about the production, like Tombstone was a troubled production. They started shooting with a director and that director got fired. And then Kurt Russell had to bring in a director to ghost direct that he was really directing through him because he couldn't, because he was the actor and the director was removed and there's rules against that. So it was this whole thing. Um, and and it still came out the way that it did. And Kurt Russell was staying up nightly doing sh shot lists while prepping for his scenes as an actor. You know, all of this being dropped on him last minute. And knowing those things makes you watch the movie in a different way, realizing how these filmmakers put this film together and look at this thing, you know. Um, and I think watching films like that is really educational. And I'm not able to watch brand new films like that. Um you know, you do Not right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You do. Like, you know, when I saw uncut gems, there were times I was taken out of the movie because it was so good that I was, I started looking at where the camera was and stuff, but then you sink right back into it. But mostly you're just, you're engrossed in the story and you're not really paying attention to those things. It's on repeat viewings that I really pay attention to those things, but so far removed from those nineties films has been uh, a really interesting like education in, in watching film plus it's just that that nostalgia is just great i mean i I've, I've done very similar work and i guess it's like you're saying i i jump back and have been re-watching all these 80s movies the late 80s movies because i'm yeah. i'm a child I'm of the 80s, 80s for sure and I, yeah. and I mean there is definitely more story back then i mean the they're 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 like reading a book basically back then now they're, they're interested in visually trying to tell a story as opposed to just telling the story and, and letting it be a part. Um, I don't know. I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think you, you have similarities there. You have like, you know, Indiana Jones was a spectacle and you have stuff like that with like the Marvel movies and such. But I mean, the thing I always say is it's like it's it's the audience's fault. Like Hollywood is a business. They want to make money. And when a movie makes a billion right. dollars, they're going to make they that movie yeah. And when the second one makes a billion dollars, they're going to make a third one. And then when the third one makes a but but I, I always bring up Annihilation because I thought Annihilation was brilliant and it bombed. Oh, it was really it good, crap. but no like, one liked it. Of, yeah, Edge of Tomorrow did okay, but it was kind of seen, it was kind of like seen as a failure compared to what it really needed to make for what the film cost plus, you know, uh, uh, all the people. Are they making that, a second one now? And yet the well there's been talk about a second one for a long time hopefully they make a second one because well, they I, gotta get I, him out of space yeah. now because yeah now he's gonna be in space wherever we get the guy back geez so tom cruise one yeah. up everybody i think there's a huge aspect to like you know you that phrase that everyone says hollywood's out of ideas no it's not it's just really hard to get those ideas made because when they are made nobody watches them <laughs> they, they love to do that known commodity thing so yeah they, they, they buy I mean, properties that, that exist 
Yeah. And then we look back and there's films that weren't well received that are now like just like uh, Blade Runner is one that wasn't incredibly well received. Like, and that's one of the most brilliant films. Um, Office and, Space. <laughs> was that not? Because that definitely became a cult classic for sure. Oh, yeah. It was, it was a flop, but it's was now. It really? I didn't know that. Yeah, well, we had Charles Pappard on here just a few weeks ago, and he was he was on that show. Did you, you should go watch they, that um, one. The what channel is that on? I, I, that's on your channel. Scott. He went. He was the first one to go five hours. He was the one that oh, Josh and Jason were beating, and he didn't man. do no ten one. I, he's a legend. He's, um, five hours. So that, no yeah. Quite question down there is, do you see a trend of 90s-esque films coming out similar to Stranger Things in the 80s genre? I would love to see that. Um, I think you I think you will, um, you know, because we, we're, we're finding our way at the end of this 80s thing. Um, and I've even told my managers, like, man, if you find, like, a 90s-style action movie, please send it to me, please. Um, and I've been – I have one concept that's kind of in the ballpark that I'm trying to flesh out, but I, I can't really crack. And But that sort of, like, die hard with a vengeance, that old school – because now, I mean, Extraction was a badass horror film. It was great. I, I, I really dug it. But it's, you know, it's so – bleak it's like when you know the kills happen it's like oh my god that was disturbing you know it's not just fun and the only films for me that i really see doing that still are marvel films which i i do love marvel films i i, I think what the russo brothers did uh is really impressive and have some of the coolest action i've seen in a long time but I personally am less interested in somebody who wields the power of lightning than I am in somebody who, you know, has a hangover, is flawed, and is having a really shitty day and just trying to stay alive and do the best they can. You know what I mean? Like, you know, those sort of uh, ask human beings, you know, making their way through a situation. That's what excites me and I, what I think is really fun. Again, I do, I do dig superheroes, but I would love to see that that sort of movie make a bigger comeback do you recall the earliest horror film that attracted you to the genre oh man um <clears throat> i don't know um i think i've always been kind of uh attracted to it like even stuff that i wrote when i was super young was like a horror movie where is this kid and there was something under his bed and you know um, <laughs> and i think it's i was a major scaredy cat when i was a little kid like i couldn't go to the bathroom without every light that ever existed being flipped on and it was like even until like i was like 17 and i still had those problems and so i ended up being like this is let's bring in your wife right now she has some no, no. <laughs> I was like, you know, this is nuts. I have these crazy fear problems. I need to conquer this. So at like 17 years old, I started like consciously like I need so to. So you started bringing them to life. That so seems very, bringing life. very logical. But I, think that's, I think that's really like a, a huge portion of why I'm drawn to it for sure is because it, it affected me so much of a kid and it was something that really um, drew me toward it. Um, and there were certain things like I definitely remember seeing um, Nightmare on Elm Street on TV. And that was like, my God, what did I just see? Um, <laughs> Jurassic Park as an 11 year old was full on a horror movie. Um, uh, yeah, I think those two are the first ones that come to mind. Like when I really think back, it was like Nightmare on Elm Street on television. And just that part where his arms are like elongated and he's like scratching down the and that was just like, what am I even watching? <laughs> um, and, uh, and and yeah, and Jurassic Park. I think those I think those two are probably the ones that I would point to. Uh, let's see. There was another question related to horror. Where did it oh, go? and the haunting. Some old classics like you know the haunting. Uh, God, I love that movie. Those those. Uh, I think the first like horror movie I ever saw when I really wasn't supposed to was called The Keep, and I watched oh, it again. It's really bad, but it scared me. <laughs> I mean, bet. hell out of me. Metric butt ton. Oh man, what's a uh, Vincent Price uh, House on Haunted Hill? House Not great. Haunted. That was a court. But, yeah. but it, it yeah. like creeped me out as a little kid. There was another one here. I go well. Okay, if you have a horror movie question, put it down below. I lost it in the long thing. Um, it's a question for you. Uh, do you think? Do you think should making directing a COVID nineteen movie? No. Anyway. no. No. And I've been on a lot of calls recently with different people and every executive and producer that I talk to says, 
you know, it ends up in a general, it's like a general call is just, who are you? you tell me about yourself and what got you into this and da, da, da. And are you a psychopath? Are you a person I can get along with? You know what I mean? That's the call. And then here's our company. Here's what we do. We liked your short film. We like this. We think you're good. What do you... And then it's, well, what else are you working on? And, um, uh, and then if you have stuff, you pitch it. And then they always end up being like, well, I would love to find something to work with together. Uh, these are the types of things we're looking for. And every time without fail, Please do not make a pandemic movie. Please don't come to us with a pandemic. Movie. Nobody <laughs> wants it. Get it. That it's, movie, it, it wants will it. that movie be made? Yes, but it'll be in a little while and it'll be by somebody like Oliver Stone, not you. <laughs> what the world probably is going to want right now, in my opinion, and what I've heard from other people, uh, you know, is going to be lighter things. Like when the world's on fire, you want things to take your mind away from that. And that's something great that film can do. It can bring wonderful messages, which, you know, if you have that, great. Um, and it can bring a release, which is very much needed. You know, like you can't be stressed 24 hours a day. You need to meditate at some point. And film can bring that gift as well. Uh, Dave points out Creep Show. Creep Show was pretty bad for me as a kid. I was Tales from the Crypt, the TV show. Oh. And, and Twilight Zone too had some had some moments, and and Lee Lee and Shingo or <laughs> Lee, Lee I, I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name. Thank you so much for the, uh, the super chat. That's nice. Um, Contagion is basically it. Uh, whoops, there we go. Um, yeah, just just replay Contagion. You're good. <laughs> yeah. Um, how often do you rewatch your projects, and how do you react when you do? Ooh. Uh, pretty much never. Um, I usually do if someone has seen it and comments on it. And I'm like, really? Wait, I didn't see that part. <laughs> no, it's like, you liked it. It was good. You you want to talk to me because of it? You lying. And then I kind of, and then I'll go back and watch it. And like, was it good? I feel like it wasn't good. Um, or if I have to send, like I had to send some short films the other day. So I was rewatching which ones do I want to send and which ones do I want to pretend didn't happen. So if it's one of those two things, sometimes it'll be like nostalgia where I'm like talking to a friend, like, oh, I remember shooting it and da da da. And then it's like, okay, I kind of want to go revisit that. But um, it's extremely rare. The, I, I did enjoy the episode where you went back and watched the wow. original, original film ride, uh, before uh, film ride. <laughs> that one was priceless. Because somehow, <laughs> I, before well, you had posted that, I had found it back in my stalking days. I had found. Uh, on some website, your original one, and I had watched it. Oh my yeah, God. it's gone now because I went back. I was like, I gotta send this to him. Yeah, exactly. Well, but if I remember correctly, you said there was actually a show before that, or a, a, a short, or something that you said would never see the light of day. Yeah, I've done it. Ah, man, I don't even know how much stuff that I've. And I'm happy to say we have it right here, and we're getting all. Oh, let's do it. I don't even know. I'm like, whatever. It's what wise. It is. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've done a bunch of different stuff. Like I, I did a, I did a web series for Alienware. Um, I've done, uh, I did a few short films that were online for a minute, but I think those websites don't even exist anymore, so they're definitely not online. And I don't even think I have them anymore, which is a bummer. I've always been really terrible at cataloging things and keeping things, which is sad. Um, <clears throat> but you know, I come from the same place you come from, where we made things just to make them there was nowhere to post them we just made them and then we showed them nope. to the people that we could show them to when we hit play personally for them and that was about it and then we and went then when you post them, them they're like uh this is not very good for today no this was 30 years ago yeah. give me a little that, credit that's, that's something I've, I've been talking about lately is i think there is a danger in the current uh, I make a thing and I post a thing and I want people to watch the thing. Whereas we came from a time frame where it was like, you make something to try to make something good and no one's really going to watch it. You know that there's, you know, these handful of people that you yeah. know you go to, and then you're going to make the next one and hope it's better than the next, that one. And you're doing it leading to a hopeful place. That's why you're doing it. Not because you're going to get so many views and likes and thumbs up and comments on this thing, but of the eventual thing <clears throat> that's worthy of an audience. Cause when you start off, you're not making something worthy of an audience. It's, you, you there's a handful of people, maybe, but that's such a small grouping of people. Like, you know, no one starts painting and paints this amazing canvas off the bat. That's just not a thing. Um, and I think photography, music and film can have that vibe to it that people think they could just pick it up and I should be able to do it right away. It's like, no, dude, you're 17 and you've made two shorts. No, like keep going. Like you, you're talented. Keep going. Like talented talent without experience is, you know, 
unrefined talent that needs to now be refined. So um, that's something that I've tried to talk about a lot in the show and stuff, because I think that is really important for young filmmakers to wrap their head around that. It's great that you can put stuff on YouTube and get feedback if you know you don't have people to to show it to but that can be dangerous too because you know the type of comments that exist on youtube i mean there are on some of the shorts that got the most attention and op blew open doors for me to be able to do some of the stuff that's going on behind the scenes now are shorts that had people on it literally saying stop trying you know and thankfully i have a core group of people around me that that those those things sting and they hurt and they suck to read at any level but um you know i imagine if those comments were made to me 10 years ago, it could have had a much you know, yeah. had effect. And so that stuff all always concerns me that like the next incredible storyteller might be, you know, stunted in some way because of those things and stuff, but maybe not because, you know, the people that do do it, do have the disease that keep, we keep talking about and they just keep pushing forward just regardless. Well, I mean, I, I basically learned how to deal with it through you learning how to deal with it through <laughs> Steph, I believe it was, who said, basically, don't ever reply to a negative comment. Let other people do your battles for you. Yeah, that took a few years to figure that out. And that's not always I that's not always how I handle it. Like one thing that I've I realized was there, there's a few ways that I'll handle it. One, I'll ignore it. And uh, hopefully everybody ignores it because probably that person is just trying to pick a fight. Two, it's somebody where they're not mad about your video about a teleportation effect. They're mad about something. Something really crappy is going on in their life. And so sometimes if it feels like that's what that comment is, like, come on, you're not mad about that. Like something's up. Um, I have commented to those people and just been on it. Like, hey, there's no way that you're this upset about this. I truly hope whatever's going on with you right now, you, you know, hit me up on Twitter if you ever want to talk. And there's a few people that, you know, you know, have come back and been like, you're right. I apologize. I never thought you would read this. Um, and that's kind of the danger of the internet too, is like, I, I think it's less so now, but it's like, yeah, there's a human on the other side of that, just like you. And what you just said is going to hurt. And I yep. think that doesn't really click with some people. And so there's been quite a few people that that comment has either a, it's, it's an example for everyone else who reads it or B, you know, that person will take what you said to heart and not think you're being sarcastic or cause I'm not, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm not trying to get, get a gotcha and be holier than now. I'm like, really like, clearly you're going through a thing, you know, if you need somebody to talk to, cause some people just don't have somebody. Um, and that, that has kind of turned, uh, in a good way uh, a few times over. So it just depends on, on the scenario. It's hard to figure out which is which sometimes. We have a gear question here from German and I'm going to piggyback it with, cause I already know the answer to this, but uh, answer in addition to it, what decisions do you make a, as a filmmaker and as a company to buy gear? So the question is, do you own a red or an Alexa mini? I don't own either of those because we don't use them enough. <clears throat> um, Film Riot and the workflow, it just doesn't make sense for us and it's not needed. Um, it's a little overkill for what we do, but we do use those on shoots. Usually an Alexa Mini. I personally gravitate towards the Alexa Mini more than the Red, but I have used the Red on a few things when it, it made more sense to use the Red, um, but they're both fantastic. Uh, but for those, we just rent them. Um, and that's usually a short film or any kind of larger project. But for what we do, variant film, riot, just on a normal basis, those cameras don't make a ton of sense for us. So uh, we don't have them. So when you're, when you're evaluating gear purchase that you, purchases that you do purchase, what, what are you thinking about why you need to purchase it or, and uh, or not? A lot of gear we've been able to gather through projects, um, through collaborators and things like that. Or we get a review unit of something and we try it out and we're like, this is great. <laughs> and then we're like, let's get four more of these. And then so we'll buy those. Um, uh, so we that, that's that been really lucky is I've been able to test things. And there's been so like people will um, uh, kind of accuse us of uh, <clears throat> of selling out or whatever, but there's been a lot of products that have been sent to us that have never been on the show because I just didn't like it. And even like stuff that it's like, yeah, this is cool, but I would never personally use it. We just don't make an episode about it. if it's, unless it's something that I'm like, this is awesome. Cause there's been some lights where it's like, you're not going to use this on a million plus, you know, project right. you're not, but this can get you the result 
that that thing of five times the price can get you. And so we will have that on the show. And, right. and honestly, some of those lights are what's lighting me currently right now. Not though I have the, I have some of the lights that are five times the price, but they kind of sit on a shelf and come out when we do bigger projects. It's those lights that are, are smaller, cheaper, you know, quicker to set up. Faster, the, yeah. I, I, I usually, you know, grab for, um, and they're pretty impressive. Uh, so yeah, it's like, it's, it's all by necessity and need like what it, what's a you know what's something that's frustrating right now and what can we get to solve that issue so it's all driven by that and then oftentimes to tim's dismay i just you know i'm like a kid in a candy store and, oh that's cool i want it <laughs> i'm better about that now i've like calmed down with that quite a bit do, do you have plans to come out like a, like a with some of the products that you faked along the way that you just made a joke and it ended up being something that should exist. Like, like on the podcast, there was the whole honey thing with you and Josh. And then like, gosh, way back, uh, um, uh, Josh had the film connection that he was making his own little website that, that you have all these different things that you've created along the way. I, I, those are just two. All uh, patent pending. Have ever, yeah. Are, are you, have you ever thought about is like coming out with it? Like, screw it. Let's just do it. I don't even lives. remember them. <laughs> like That's I mean, sad. I would love to like go find. I it, I there like I was saying before. There's so many like take a shower. You'll yeah, remember. I'm take a shower. <laughs> remember <them. laughs> um, <laughs> uh, there's so many like we used to do so many cutaways and stuff that it's just like I don't remember half of them. Um, and I would love to like find time to go back and see those those little like ridiculous jokes that we made. Um, just because it was just because it really was like a bunch of friends goofing off and like, hey, this would be funny. Do this now, you know. OK, homework for all the viewers on this one, on the next, not the one right now, on the next Film Riot post, just in the comment section, just put your favorite product that that they they uh, created or favorite reference that they never followed up with. I, just, just randomly. I, I submit this. I like this. I co-sign this. Give it to me now. You've never said who was inside the robot. Who was inside the robot? I never will. <laughs> no Fair. one. It was no a robot. one. It was no one. It was a robot. Uh, question for you. I've always wanted to know who's inside the robot and who was right. in the gorilla costume and will never say. <laughs> Are film festivals or competitions worth participating in in this day and age, COVID aside? Should people uh, just focus on the client and passion projects? I mean, passion projects find their way to festivals and sometimes client projects can as well. So I don't think those are exclusive to one another. Um, but should you do a festival? I mean, if that's your path, uh, I have some friends who, who do do the festival circuit. Um, for the most part of people that I personally know, because with this stuff, you have to keep in mind it's all personal experience stuff and there are no one direct path toward a thing there are things that you know work a little better like lucky for me i do love horror and i have a ton of horror ideas and horror films are an easier pathway into getting a film made as a first time director so there are things that yes it's easier to easier to x but that's also not always true or the case and depends on what you want to make and what you want to do. Uh, so with that, it's really about like, what's your end goal? And, you know, do you have somewhere that you can release it to that would be, you know, online, that would be much better. Or, you know, do you want to do the festival circuit first, then go online because a lot of festivals won't take it if you want to go online first. So it's gotta be like that sort of thinking for you. Like what, what's your end goal with this? What are you aiming toward? and then pick what's right for you based off the information that you've gathered. Um, I just really don't think that there's one right way. For me, festivals have never made sense. Um, they're just not the type of things that I make or wanted to make. Um, you know, like I said, the short films that I've even made are, there's, they're, they're ambiguous, they're, they're, you know, um, they're action, they're horror, they're, you know, goofy, they're weird. Um, and th those aren't really festival shorts. They don't, you know, wouldn't do super well in festivals. Um, so, uh, you know, for that reason as well, it just never made sense to me. But I've also been very lucky and blessed to have a platform to put my work out to for people to watch. So there's that as well to, you know, that I'm aware of. So, you know, festivals, I think I, from what I, I know of and people I've talked to, one of the best things about festivals is, 
you are entering into that and meeting people of like mind, you know, and if you don't go to film school, which I think that's, you know, nowadays, one of the main reasons to, if, you know, only reason to go to film school is to create those bonds and those friendships that you will carry through, you know, to other things. And I think film school could be that, th or um, film festivals could be that thing for sure. But, you know, it's mildly, you know, me talking out of my ass because I've, I've done one film festival, <laughs> you know, so you got to take that as well. But I will say that everyone that I know that has gotten a film deal did not get it off of film festivals. They got it off of putting their thing online. And a lot of people that I've even talked to recently have told me that they have interns or assistants or just a department that their job is they watch short films and then they pass along the good ones. And that's how ballistic got found by a few producers is, is through that. Um, I think it was first showing posted an article about ballistic and, you know, a lot of people found it because of that assistance found it, passed it up to their, the creative executives who dug it and then reached out. Um, so I think just getting your stuff out there for that, you just need the right person to see it. And what do you think is your best, best pathway to the right person to see it? And you could go online eventually do the film festival thing first. Why not? You know, if that's enticing to you and you think that'd be a good path for you, try that first and then, and then go digital after that. Uh, related question here. Did, do you feel like, or did you feel like social media and YouTube were a good step for your career? And do you find yourself having to give up opportunities because of your obligation to film riot? No, um, no, I no don't to the second part of the note of the first one. Uh, <laughs> good question. Would you like to restate uh, the answer? Yeah, I, uh, I'm incredibly thankful for what, you know, film riot has given me career wise. I mean, I, I make no, I, I'm very objective in the fact that I am where I am. Thanks to film riot and the wonderful people that attached to film riot and has followed film riot and supported film riot. Like that's why I'm doing what I'm doing currently. That's why I've been able to make the short films that I've been able to make. That's why, you know, I've got some of the, you know, opportunities that I currently have that maybe could lead to me doing the thing I've wanted to do my whole life. It's not because, you know, uh, you know, your talent or anything like that. I, I mean, I, you know, you, luck favors they're prepared for sure but you know film riot has really been the thing that has given me the gifts that i've been given so far so i'm very thankful for it um i think you know i would have gotten there regardless to some extent who knows who knows where i would have gotten to uh without film riot i definitely would be making films but i don't know to what degree uh you know because again it goes back to that disease we can't not you know even right now if everything fell apart i would go make a short film i just have to i can't not um so yeah the youtube youtube has been incredible um for that and i think even without film riot I would heavily be on YouTube. I'd be posting all my films on YouTube and and doing what doing what I do with my films now. It's like just because we have film right doesn't mean people are posting articles about it. You know, uh, almost I don't think we got any articles, but maybe one on there comes a knocking maybe and that was something that was a proof of concept where people don't really put proof of concepts out like that so it had a bit of a story behind it and it's film riot and uh but nobody picked nobody cared <laughs> you know uh, <laughs> our, audi our audience cared you know the, our supporters people who love film right and um are awesome enough to to show up for the stuff that we do um watched it and whatnot um but uh, ballistic got passed around a little bit but even that had maybe four articles total done on it and even the way that i got that was not because oh film right put out a short film nobody cared it's just that i found story, that story 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 yeah somebody found i found that somebody from first showing like followed me on twitter and i tweeted them was like hey you know i don't want to waste your time but i would love for you to check this out no obligation if you dig it and did something on it that'd be wonderful if not whatever i would just like to hear what you have that because i really do love that site and i love the stuff that they write so it was like even for them to just watch it and tell me what they thought would have been awesome and they were cool enough to do an article um but that's even how i get any of that as i'm still doing and that's what i would be doing with or without film riot um but <clears throat> film riot has been obviously like i said just an amazing gift um that I'm, I'm very thankful for so yeah social media has been wonderful even on you know even on the um which i think this is true for everyone is just on the um the community it can build in any way and if you're putting out work of any kind even if you you have like a thousand subscribers that's a lot of people that is a lot of like how many people can fit into one theater 
you know, mm-hmm. and you'd be freaking thrilled to show your short film to a theater of a thousand. You'd be losing. Dude, there's a thousand people in the theater right now to watch our film. And you have a thousand subscribers. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's insane. And those people are going to react to your film. Um, and there, you know, there was not through my youth was that anything that that was even remotely like conceivable to me like if there was 20 i'd be like awesome (laughs) you know (laughs) um so it's like that stuff is really useful for just anyone of getting that feedback of you know once you're once you're moving forward and you're not letting it block you like we talked about before and um social media i have a love-hate relationship like everyone does there's it can be such a dumpster fire but it also can be really beautiful uh in the connections you can have on there as well um, you know, there's some people <clears throat> that I recognize and, and whenever they post anything to me, I respond or like it. Cause I'm like, Oh, I know you. And have right. even said like, Hey, I'm so-and-so on Twitter. I'm like, Oh my God. Yes. I know you, <laughs> you know, that's, that's really cool. Um, so that stuff is great. And I think that, you know, for sure has been helpful to, um, my career. I've been very lucky, uh, with that. Was there a second part of that question? Uh, well, it was, uh, there was, uh, did, so did you have to give up opportunities because you're part of Film Riot or because no. your obligation to Film Riot? No, not at all. I think Film Riot has brought a lot of opportunities for sure. Like, I, you know, like I was saying, um, and you know, it's thankfully I have Josh and my brother, Tim and Emily and all that. And they, they're amazing and, and help me whenever I have to like step away for a second and be like, Hey, I have to focus on this now because this has popped up um and likewise you know we're all we're all there for each other it's such a dumpster fire (laughs) (laughs) uh kind of pseudo with with the whole film right and relationships and such uh the guest of honor uh from justin robinson what was your role in in that movie your producer guest of honor yeah did i say yeah i I just uh (laughs) i just i just helped him um you know find a little bit of budget i really did you know i i can't i can take zero credit from that right you know uh i would love to because it's really yeah it's it's great justin is very talented uh, like, so talented and i was just super stoked to have my name on. i'm like can i get yo yo let me get my name on your film can, now. It, <laughs> can you spell it right <laughs> yeah just because i think you know it's a matter of time to he's making so, like oh, yeah. he's the type of filmmaker that wins awards i don't think that's the type of film well he's got seven thousand ideas a second coming out of him he it's does and there's so unique and they're so um empathetic and so wrapped inside of like the human condition and 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 just very he just has such a a unique singular voice um that it's just something i want to be plus he's the type of person that you know would give you the shirt off your his back at any time you know he he said shirt right (laughs) yeah i did maybe i didn't Uh, wow um I don't know how long he worked with us. I can't, I can't remember how long he was uh, at Film Riot, but he ended up going back to because he wanted to get back into you know doing feature, being on feature sets. But most importantly, he wanted to marry his girlfriend, who is now his wife. Um, but man, we talk about Success. all the time. Like God, I wish you were still here. It's, he's just such a good dude, and he's always doing for other people. So it's like, he's one of those people that's like you deserve to succeed more than pretty much anyone I know. You've, you've had lots of people come through uh, over the years through Film Riot. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I can't ask that because that's not a fair question because you know, who would you choose to come back if you could? That's not a fair question to ask because you'd yep. be like, John. all of them? What? Justin. <laughs> i love that man but yeah there's been a lot of people that come through a lot of uh some that weren't even filmmakers some that you know they were there for a time and then they moved on to do their own thing and it's something that i, I mean i even tell you know family members that work for me it's like the second that you feel shackled to this in any way you let me know and i will bend over backwards to help you go on to whatever it is the next thing is it's like i want film riot to be a stepping stone for or triune to be a stepping stone for people to head toward that creative goal yeah, as an as incubator you know, yeah. yeah and we're heading in that direction we've been heading in that direction for a long time if i want to be bringing in more filmmakers and you know uh unique and different you know, diverse voices that build them up and then, you know, let them make the short films. I'm not making them anymore. Let somebody else do that. You know, Josh is going to start doing that and then let that lead to the next thing for him. And while the next person's moving up behind him and then the next person, and then film, right. Gets to, you know, show all these voices and their process, their perspective of filmmaking, what works for them. Cause you know, that writing 
episode is a really good example of that is like me and Ricky did it together because the way we think about getting into a story is extremely similar. So I thought that would be interesting to, it wouldn't be contradictory ideas. They would be, you know, a unified idea in a slightly different way, but it would make sense all the way through. Whereas if I would do it with Seth, it would be, it'd be pretty different. And I, I think Seth is a far better writer than I am. Um, but he has a, a slightly different process. Like he does the, the story clock with, I, which I think right. is genius and I love it. Um, we put it on the show a ton of times cause I just think it's so smart, but uh, my brain just doesn't work that way. And uh, it's just a different process. And so I would love to bring in, you know, those different process of like getting into storytelling visually, you know, written, whatever it is, um, and not just be one singular voice over and over again saying how they, that person does this, you know, um, and event eventually we will definitely get through that. And it'll, like you say, be this incubator that hopefully keeps churning. Right. Out. Well, um, you, you're definitely, you're, you're already an incubator. You're just not calling it an incubator. You're not, you, you may not have intended it to be, but you literally have created an incubator that it, I mean, it's kind of a slow incubator right now, but you're, that's what it is. People come in, they get inspired by, by you. They get, they get broadened by by you and your your you know massive crowds of people. <laughs> they 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 just you know they draw inspiration from people around them, and, and that's uh, that's one of the things that 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 I really enjoy about you is that I can draw from you from your inspiration, and it and it kind of drips down slowly like that honey. That's a weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, showers are never going to be the same. Oh, my again. Honey. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, that, that's what you're doing in, in a way, whether you see it or not. I clearly, I think you see it. Um, and if you see my camera move, it's because my dog is now laying up against the tripod leg. And he's done this in all of the others. Oh, man. It would be nothing better if it was just all of a sudden like. Oh, it, no. <laughs> no, it kind of goes. You'll see me just kind of just move over here because the camera's moved over this way. Because oh, he's like 150 pounds and he just like sprawls out. Mine probably moves the, because I can't not touch the table and it's on my monitor. Oh, oh, yeah, got a little Logan action happening. <laughs> yeah, like, I like that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. All right, so we got 15 minutes left with you. Um, I want to make sure we cover anything that you didn't get to say already. And then I've got some other questions here. But I'm, I think you know. we're, we're good to 6.15. Okay. 6.15 uh, is this. my like hard, hard out. <laughs> like, got to go. <laughs> Running out of time. It, it'll take me one minute to close it out when we're done. And then I'll have you down on the bottom and then we'll, uh, we got to chat just for a moment, just, just one minute. So we'll 613. We'll, we'll do it that way. <laughs> Timing. Timing. Okay. So if you got questions for them, put them down below. We'll try to get to them here and do a rapid fire. If there's such a thing, uh, Robert Del Tour, um, what would you say has been the most unexpected way that the, your experiences with the show has popped up in other aspects of your life? Uh, basically, basically how it's influenced you over the past 10 years of film riot, uh, in every way, um, personally and professionally, you know, it's like, you know, putting out that stuff for an audience and seeing how they respond to it, you know, just general, how you talk about things and then seeing people respond that and sort of slap you on the hand when you're not seeing somebody else's perspective that you should be seeing and, and learning, you know, how someone might take offense to something and that was never your intention. Um, you know, all those things it's <clears throat> having, it's just been such, I keep saying thankful and blessing because it is, and it's, it's been such a nice bit of growth just as a person and a professional because of all those things. You just have so many different people with so many different backgrounds and viewpoints giving you their two cents, whether, whether you ask for it or not. And that's great because then you get to see all all how people, you know, even if there's just two out of 20 who were frustrated by how you phrase something, well, now that's something you can think about. Okay, well, if I would have just said it like this, then I would have, and it's really shaped <clears throat> my thinking of how I talk about film, how I talk about other people's work, how I give feedback to people, you know, it's like, on a on um something we just did somebody made a comment about how somebody's film wasn't a short film because it made no sense i was like okay well you didn't get it i got it it wasn't my film and i totally got it and you're calling somebody's work not a short like you're <clears throat> belittling someone's you're lessening someone's work because you personally did not like it it would have been fine to say that if it was that was this was good about that you know it was gorgeous 
however, for me, I didn't really get what the point of it was. But you know, great stuff overall. You know, so you could you could say those things. You could say what you meant, but it's for you personally. You think like that subjective thing has really been like pushed into my mind, which I think is extremely helpful in understanding how to take what people say to you on any level and, you know, say things to people. Um, so across the board, it's, it's been really, really useful. Um, like I was saying earlier, it taught me how to uh, pitch. I've been pitching a lot and having to verbally pitch. And I think, you know, six years ago, if you would have asked me to do that, it would have been, uh, uh, I don't, uh, you know, but all this stuff, doing the podcast, doing all these things, it has really taught me how to, you know, be eloquent in those things and be concise with my ideas and, you know, convey them to someone and understand how they're going to process them. Because it's not, it's not until you say the things that are in your head to a person that you really start to figure out how they, and that's kind of uh, process them. I, do, I have a, I have a way of not finishing my sentences. <laughs> um, Wait, what? Them. And that's kind of filmmaking in general, right? Like it's like, if I want to tell you a story, I want to tell that story as economically as possible, because if I do that, then you are, you know, sinking into that story in a very organic and personal way. And in a way where you don't, feel like I'm sitting there with a spoon feeding you every little bit that I need to feed you. You never want, I never personally want an audience to feel that. I want the audience to feel like they're enjoying this meal themselves. And that's when you get those moments of, you know, uh, you're excited that, oh, I figured this thing out, but it's because I told you, but you feel, you know, that, that gratifying, you know, moment of like, oh, those two things came together. And, um, you know, it's stuff like, uh, short films are great for, practicing that too you know it's like there comes a knocking even it was like if i show you the wilting roses and then i show you what she's doing and then i show you the picture then the moment that you hear the friends so it was like a very conscious idea of those sequences of events which lead to she's pouring wine she's by herself she's clearly upset you hear him talking oh, okay he's coming home and then we go to the friend uh, something wrong happened and then she replays the mess and the second she replays the message hopefully you get it everything that came before it it's like oh flowers from the funeral the picture the door that she's putting it up because of and it's, all of it comes full and it's that you know figuring out and you know it won't work for everyone and that's and it's understanding and accepting that too and again that's what film right has taught me is that no matter how good a thing is there's going to be a lot of people who don't like it. It's just how it is. Not everybody likes the taste of this right. thing. Um, but, you know, all these short films and trying these different things and even just Film Riot doing it on a weekly basis and not really worrying about making the best, most pro-looking thing I can, but worrying about trying concepts um, was really my thing with everything I did. Had had really helped me kind of see people would ask the ideas that I putting in front of them if that makes sense you know mm -hmm. and i think you know that's obviously paramount to storytelling is understanding how your intended audience uh and not everybody's going to love it is going to process the idea that you're putting in front of them um and so that becomes it starts to become like tools that you're using like when i did tell i talk about all the time it was i made tell off instinct i feel like it was less it, it wasn't so much things I could articulate and say, I'm doing this because this is why and here's how it's going to work. And there were things that definitely worked, but I couldn't have articulated that to you. When I did There Comes a Knocking, it was like, I'm going to do these things because I think when we get here, all these things, you know what I mean? It's, so it gets to be also this fun, you know, puzzle piece you're putting together for the audience. Um, and it becomes this kind of relationship with the audience that you you have even before you're, you're playing it. Um, but that directly comes from all of, you know, the, the experience of allowing someone to process what you're saying. Um, so I think that, that aspect of it has been the biggest advantage that I've had out, out of the whole thing. If that makes sense. I don't know if any of that made sense. <laughs> Robert's over there going, I'm going to have to rewatch that. I, I, I'm in you the know shower. What he just right said. Dude said he knows how people process this stuff and he just made no sense for five minutes. <laughs> it's like, I need a good shower. Um, so, uh, so you're 
Yeah, this is kind of like a two part question here. You're you're kind of a machine. It, it appears from from the outside world that Absolutely. you know you, you're working continuously, but it seems like you found balance now, or or at least have figured out more balance with with you know personal time, home time, and all that. How many hours a week do you work, and what is your balance? You know, don't you don't have to go too per personal, but you know, what's your balance routine like? To, to keep it yeah i don't i don't mind getting personal let's get uh, let's go crazy we already got personal i'm just talking <laughs> let's go, about let's go, baby. <laughs> um, i i don't know how many hours i work a week right now way too freaking much it's kind of gone back with once i came home with with once everybody was at home things started moving in certain areas a lot more and then obviously being at home and things being more remote than usual obviously slowed down the machine a little bit and you know things shifting in different ways slowed down the machine a little bit but it also got busier than it's been in a long time and in, in several different areas so it oh good <laughs> so, um it I, I've actually have reverted to a really crappy schedule that I'm trying to fix again, but it's just, you know, there's 24 hours a day and I need 28 to get everything done. So there's a lot of stuff that you have to just decide that you're just not doing today. And that just, there's always 10 to 20, literally that I'm like eh, tomorrow um, and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and uh, studio manager slash producer, which is also my sister, Ashley helps me like wrangle all that. And she's like a godsend because without her, I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> before that, before this all happened, I was starting to get a decent like work life balance going on there and it you know it's all credit to my wife like you know she's the she's a much better person than i am she's like the teacher of all empathy and sensitivity and life to me <laughs> she's like focuses me when she's I, like crap he's home like, again yeah <laughs> all right um and it was like when we had you know my first daughter that really started to set in and i got a little bit better my first daughter i only have one daughter when we had my first kid which is my daughter um and then we had my second kid my son and and it really set in and um i believe she's the one i said i don't think this is my thought but i think she's the one that told me like when you're 80 you're not going to regret the movies you didn't make you're going to regret the time you missed with your family and you know that hit pretty hard and then seth Worley told me about this app where it was like this daily journal app um, where you put a picture in and, and you write something about what happened that day. And I just made it like, a, oh, how cool if I just did that daily just for the fun of it. And then that really set in of like what I did that day. And I spent no time with my kids that day. No memories were made that day. And that was an entirely oh. wasted day. Like I can't get that day back. Like they'll never be that many days old ever again you know they'll never learn that word over again that i missed that they learned or did that thing that you know and that really really like kind of set into me what how was, much i was jipping myself of being a part of that part of life that, that really matter back. yeah are, are you the type of person that journals or is that is that no. a totally new concept yeah no so that just not at all just, um yeah, so that was like brand new to me. And since then, it's fallen off it just works. because I can't keep up with it. <laughs> it's, about, it's only 28 hours in a day, yeah, like 24. Yeah, it's too much. I got to do it. My wife is like the memory keeper. She's just, everything that's good, yes. it comes from her, not me. <laughs> not me. <laughs> Including uh, the things that are bad. She'll bring those back bad. up too. <laughs> yeah. Let me know. Um, but it, it's really those concepts that finally like wrapped that. And, and you know, my brother, Tim, has always told me like, um, you know, it, everything's not, you know, going to fall apart overnight. You're going to come back to the office and get back to work. Like, you know, and, and, and so, uh, you know, he's been, cause he's got four kids, um, 10 and up. So he knows, and he's been somebody who's, you know, worked his ass off. And so he's been and my dad too. My dad uh, had a whole lot of kids and he had to work a whole lot of hours because he also owned the company like I do with Train Films. And and so he's been somebody who's really given me a lot of perspective as well. That's really driving home that I got to make films and I will. But if I make five instead of 10, that won't be the thing that matters when, again, I'm 80 and my kids have kids it's going to yeah. be the other things like recently it's just bumming. I, you know, and that's, that is one of the things that has been great about being home is like, even though I'm working, 
you know, it's great. It's adorable. My, my kids wanted to make me coffee. They're four and two. And I drink so much coffee that they asked my, my <laughs> wife if they could make and bring me coffee. And so like stuff like that happens on my wall. I have a shrine of stuff they've drawn for me. And, and I hear them playing downstairs all day, which also, by the way, just has leveled up my respect for my wife by like a thousand. Like I already <laughs> thought. How are you doing this? <laughs> yeah. But just hearing her like day in and day out, like how much of an unbelievable mother she is has been another like amazing uh you know side effect to being having to be home and work but you know just being able to ah, i'm just gonna go down and hug them you know it's been really nice uh i wish we could just all work at home <laughs> just just keep that going she's like but, you know um, what no yeah. you got an office just just go yeah <laughs> i feel like i'm just rambling loving family currently no, but no. um but yeah it's like it's it's those things i could definitely boil it down to very easily that thought of when you're 80 what are you really gonna regret that you missed fair enough uh this one could get very long of an answer for you which i know that sounds <laughs> weird <brilliant> for me <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know where he's coming from um so try to try to condense it down we don't want it to be a whole film riot post-production thing but he, he's interested in your workflow with, with the green screen um he is kind of bottlenecked in his workflow he's how do you guys do it what is your workflow um uh, so just like on a film right episode yeah um it's you know yeah but so idea then you know sometimes we script sometimes we don't there's a lot of times where it is just all ad-libbed um but say if it's a scripted episode like if it's a visual effects episode i have a visual effects artist ryan thompson who's out of his mind talented like any visual effect that you've seen on our channel in the past two years that you were like oh my god ryan thompson he's just unbelievable so he'll go and write a tutorial of that um and then deliver it to me and then i'll rewrite it to you know put it in my voice a little bit more because i'm going to be the one saying it um make it a little more concise where it needs to be make it a little more understandable where it needs to be uh because you know doing film right over the years has taught me you know again how people process things uh and then we'll toss that on a teleprompter um we haven't done green screen in quite a while um i, I, I noticed you went to the the like yeah, a seamless I, paper with a, a colored yeah, light back there. it's actually just a wall and we're gonna build a set and like it's been some of this recently obviously and uh, it's been some of my office recently and it's just more real. It's just like that disconnect of a green screen is just feeling weird to us lately. So we've been wanting to get off that. But when it was green screen, we would shoot that. And then Josh would take and he would cut the green screen standups. And once that was complete, he would start keying that, the finalized uh, cut. And he would pass me the audio. I would do a sweeten of the audio. Then he would bring both those things in, link them, and then start cutting the episode from there. And then everything. And then, of course, you have previous episodes that you can then open you know in premiere you open multiple projects and then you you use that as a template you start bringing those things in and it becomes easier variant has a has a an easier way to be able to do those templates because they do different types of episodes but you know there's like you know five six different styles of episodes film riots kind of different every time um so it's a it's you know it's which I do love. I don't like getting stuck into the exact same thing over and over again. Um, but then it's just, you know, me and Josh have such a shorthand that it's just bouncing back and forth. Uh, sometimes I'll do the final grade. Sometimes, you know, Josh will, it just depends um, uh, on what's going on, but that's generally it. It's not super complicated. And now you just remove the green screen aspect of it. Um, and it's, you know, we just, we try to keep it as simple as possible. There you go, Dave. There's the answer. Remove the green screen. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about this for a while. I'm like, dude, just do it. Get rid of it. And he yeah. loves the green screen because he's been he's been doing you know, 3D elements everywhere that he he, he uh, does in the background. Yeah, once you start adding all those, like I used to be way more um, in it, like involved. It all was a little more involved, and there would be things moving and the extra VFX that like just didn't need to be, and it bogged things down and it held up ideas. So we started removing those things. Even variant, the way that the pictures were done used to be different. It was all in After Effects, and there were flares, and they were moving in 3D space, and it was like, why? Are we, this is not needed, and it's slowing why? down. Production. Let's let's simplify this. Um, and now they do it pretty much all in Premiere, and it still looks great. It's um. Also on on workflow, um, you're still uh, you don't have a NAS or anything at at your office, yeah. right? You're still you do okay. 
So y'all y'all work off projects off that way. Yeah, exactly. So we just we're all basically off the same hard drive now, essentially. Um, which happened when we moved into our studio, which God, I think is like five years ago now. It's been a while. Yeah, five, maybe six years, somewhere in there. Maybe five. Uh, don't yeah. don't push it. So, <laughs> some somewhere in that range. Um, but yeah, we we set that up, and and that was a huge help because now you're not dropping things onto a hard drive and then taking it over to their computer and taking it off. Right. Da, da, da. It's just like Josh texts me like, "Hey, man." uh i just closed the project you can open it up and finish it and then i just boop, open it up i finish the thing hit export and there we go and that's well, now you can open them up at the same time it's weird i know that we don't we don't so ever usually do that just because I, we're paranoid I wouldn't trust it. And we don't have yeah we don't have time for those sorts of issues so we just we keep the workflow of what we know works uh question for you how do you choose your topics for a film riot episode it's always just driven by whatever interests us at the time like again i keep bringing up the writing episode but um the writing episode came about because it's literally what i've been talking to people about and um like struggling over and finding my footing on and feeling confident in and like okay this is definitely and me and ricky were having a discussion about it i'm like dude, let's do an episode um uh the the episode that just went up today joe simon's episode is because he was doing that short film and i was like yep. that's badass like hey what if yep. we did this and uh, sometimes it's somebody, you know, tweets to us and is like, Hey, could you do an episode about that? It's like, that's a great idea. Um, so it's usually those things. And and we keep a Google doc of just ideas. And, you know, again, Ryan Thompson, our VFX artist is always contributing to those ideas as well. So usually if it's a visual effect, it's, it's often his idea. He's just a genius with uh, <laughs> visual effects. Um, and then, so we'll go and we'll pull for, from whatever excites us from that list, but it's always just, you know, what, do we want to do right now or what do we think would be very helpful right now? Fair enough. Uh, this one don't do 10, but what's your top three nineties movies? Oh man. I don't even, that's come on. How are you going to do this to me? Uh, Jurassic Park <laughs> obviously has to be on there. Mission impossible. Mm. Uh, uh, saving private Ryan Ooh, die hard with a vengeance. Good. Oh, good. Uh, that's four. You said three. I'll stop it. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Uh, but I'm missing like a billion. I I, yes. I, could, I could open a list. I, I have a, you know what? Go on my Letterboxd account. I have lists on there. Go look at my lists. Yes, use his Letterboxd account. Link oh, somewhere. I, I haven't put them down. God, oh, my God. <laughs> Braveheart. Braveheart's a good one. Yeah, yeah. those are other. Yeah, you're bringing out. I'm, I'm just gladiator. Which is a bad joke, by the way. Um, oh, Hunt for Red October. Oh, good one. Yes. Okay. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. <laughs> yeah, you almost got 10. Go for 10. <laughs> if you pop They Live in there, I'm going to be like, what? Was that 90s? I thought that was 80s. Yeah. No, I think it was late 80s. Okay. Everyone needs a 20 minute fight scene. I mean, it's it's the best. <laughs> uh, let's see. Speed. Speed, but not speed two. Please, not for the speed. love of God, not speed two. Not speed two. Not Wait, speed, so yes. it's a cruise ship that can't stop. <laughs> I'm no. pretty sure that's not how hydrodynamics works. Yeah. I have like a lot of um, action movies in my head because I've been watching so many action movies. Ooh, Legend of the Drunken Master. So good. Oh, that is good. Um, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. That's a good one. Uh, how did you get the opportunity to fix Roger Deacon's sound issues on his podcast? Oh, well, you know, me and Raj, we go way back. Um, <laughs> Raj. I was just listening to the <laughs> podcast and I just on a whim just – emailed them and i was like hey if you need any help i'd be more than willing and they mailed back and was like yeah and i was like cool <laughs> <laughs> i'm in with deeks yeah he and i are like this i'm over here but we're <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're awesome though they're as wonderful of human beings as they seem like on the podcast and and in uh, interviews which is wonderful because you know the people are always like you know don't meet your heroes uh but just wonderful very very kind uh people Right. I, I mean, he's, he's, I'm kind of working my way up the ladder here, you know, on the, on the, the Scott Balkum. So he's next. <laughs> I, I will, like, when are, when are you going to have him on the podcast? I'm just, I was just like, I will never ask Scott to. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. You just, you don't want to because, I mean, quite honestly, he gives so much already. It's like, yeah, it's what like, can I help? Yeah. I, what am I going to ask that they aren't already brilliantly covering on their podcast? It just doesn't feel appropriate. It's like, no, it's okay. Exactly. So what do you think about showers there, Roger? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> hey, hey, Roger, can you come over to the kitty table for a second? So That's like, right. It's like, uh, oh, Thanksgiving, <laughs> I loathe it. Yeah. 
He, he just bumped my camera too. I'll okay, just, we got. I'll just keep watching or listening to their. Yeah, no, I, I already did the wiggle. It's a minute ago. He's he's licking his leg now, so we're good for three minutes. Well, who are we talking about? <laughs> you I don't, don't want to know. If anybody just showed up into this, they're like, "What the hell is he? Who does he have in there?" Well, I mean, honestly, anybody that shows up on this, they're like, how the hell has Scott maintained a live stream for more than 30 minutes without his internet dying? It puts that's, the lotion on his skin or it gets yeah, the right. Put it in the basket. <laughs> Put it in the, I'm looking for lotion because I figured I'd have a prop laying around here. All I have are stacks of dead hard drives. Now make a joke. No. <laughs> um, okay, we got... Uh, or is it a dog or a human? No, it's a uh, it's a dog. Well, that's a horse. <laughs> no, okay, now now I can't describe what he's doing. It's inappropriate. My mom is watching. Um, all right, we got a few minutes left. So, what didn't we cover that you thought we would cover, Ryan? What what did I forget to? Uh, I never come into these things with any preconceived ideas. I kind of that's a damn it. shame. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, we talked about um a. Of uh, like every, all all the things. What else? What else would you like to talk about, Scott? Tell me. Okay. Um, well, I mean, there's lots of stuff I want to talk about, but again, PG thirteen. Up. See the see the camera. Did you see the camera. <laughs> his his ass is up against it now. Yeah, my dog too. Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> oh, we're, we're he did. I got a move like now. A, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a dick. <laughs> Uh, you're gonna like shoot I mean, your, by the time was, you're over this you're gonna be on like, the other side of the table it was on like three or four episodes ago he pointed it over here and i was by the end of the episode i was way over here it was really bad framing i felt oh, like a goof it would be great I'm like i'm so glad your comfort if you didn't have a monitor you didn't even know so like by oh. the end it's just like this <laughs> so anyway uh it's like my armpit that's all you see is yeah. I hope you're happy. Oh, I'm crying. <laughs> I'm glad I could make you cry. Okay, Chris has a good question for networking. Cold calls versus making new friends in this age of elevator pitch. Is it dying out? <clears throat> um, you know, called anything is a little bit difficult. I will say, like, if you can send an email, I don't, I don't think there's <laughs> anything wrong with that. Um, what happened? Is it your dog? What's no, I, I, uh, let me throw this one in there first, real quick. Okay. <laughs> to not be stuck up on Scott and trade shows. <laughs> uh, I've hired people. <laughs> okay. I've All hired right. Back to the cold calls. And they regulate. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, e calls, I think, are just don't do it. Um, unless you're calling like an agency, but usually they're going to be like email us. I think the best thing to do is like email, be incredible incredibly concise if that thing's long people delete it immediately i know even for me when people send me stuff i'm <clears throat> i'm extremely i'm nowhere near as busy as those those people are but i'm i'm really busy and you know there's a thousand things i need to get to right now and i open an email that's like a book the odds are i'm gonna be like oh i can't deal with that right now i need to i gotta jump back to this i got this going on and then i'll forget that that email ever, ever existed but if it's like you know a couple of sentences that gets to the point and has a link you know that that'll work and then because if the conversation is going to continue it's going to continue based off the work that you're sending them so a couple of lines and a link <clears throat> let them see that work and then if they respond to you then you can start but even when you respond don't write people a book they're never going to read it they're going to they're going to flag it as i'll get back to it later and then they never will or they'll get frustrated and delete it so concise as possible um Twitter is great. I have a lot of friends that <clears throat> have done a lot of networking with like, how'd you get that actor? It's like, oh, I just messaged him on Facebook. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, that stuff is always, but being incredibly respectful, humble, and concise, I think is key with those things. Not coming in, acting like you're a big shot because, you know, people who are doing it are going to see right through it anyway. Um, just being humble and you and objective about you know what you are doing or where you're at or what you're asking for i think is really really important concise but not too concise because remember there was a whole thing where i emailed you i said you me two hours you won't regret it and you re <laughs> responded back with restraining order <laughs> oh yeah I think I that. 
Okay, let's see here. Um, what you been drinking, or rather, just drink? <laughs> oh my god! What you been drinking? Uh, what, rather, just what this you... is water now. Uh, I have because I have a water bottle here. Uh, before it was it. bourbon. <laughs> and then the last questions off topic. I heard you play drums. True or false? Ju I I play drums. Yeah. Everybody plays yeah. drums. I like everybody sings drums. in their car. Yeah, it doesn't mean I should play the drums, but I like to play them. Josh plays the drums. Josh is uh interesting. Uh, yeah, pretty you pretty play fun. keyboards and guitar, right? No, he actually does play stuff because now he has a digital set in his apartment, so he does still play all the time. But he was really good uh for a while there, so I imagine he's still very good. Yeah, I play guitar, I play piano. Um, all of it's kind of by ear until I started really getting into like composing as a hobby and then i like took classes and you know, took some theory oh, nice. and stuff and it's still like surface level stuff just to um i have a pack on the store of some of the music that i've made but it, it you know it's a hot i would never want to compose my own film uh that's can, why i have daniel james can we get another version of lutz with butts just just like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, like yeah. a remix yeah one day we need to drop with butts. our full album Look, we we need some of your best tunes. That would actually be hilarious. So like got... J Train, baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're right up against your time here. I want to be super respectful of that. Is there anything else that uh, I mean before I, I close you out? Because no, man, just uh, thanks for doing it. It was a lot of fun. It definitely went fast. I see why people are able to do five hours on this. I think we could break the record if I didn't have a meeting in it, 15 minutes. Well, we can do it again sometime if you'd like. Anytime. Yeah, for sure. Happy. For sure. So, yeah. um, okay. So thanks so much, Ryan, for being on here. I really appreciate you. Oh, I mean, for 11 plus years, I guess, 10, 11 Something well, you don't know, but 11 years, but <laughs> 11 years watching film, right? And then there were those extra. I, I used to watch you from afar, <laughs> just behind the glass. That's right. I was the inspiration for several of your restraining orders. Um, anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for being on here. I truly appreciate your time. Uh, truly, uh, everyone, really, we had a great crowd. Um, and I mean, seriously, thanks so much. I'm going to drop you down below, just hang in there real quick. Absolutely. And I'll close Thanks, this out. Man. As always, if you have any questions or comments, put them down below. I'll try to read and respond to each and every one, even if it's just to say thanks. Uh, remember to subscribe, like, thumbs up. Uh, also remember, go to uh, the next Film Right episode and write your favorite product that they haven't produced that they said they would. Put that down there below. Uh, and then, um, yeah, as always, as I like to leave it, don't let your passions center around your life. Let your life center around your passions. See you.